appear shortly. That's better. Yeah. Do I look, look better, Murray, do I? You've always been a good looking man, Martin, you know that? <laughs> I can rely on you. No, it's not quite going to reach. Them. It's <laughs> Does one mention spec? Does one talk about spec savers in that statement, Murray? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's better, isn't it? Is that better, Nicole? Much, much better. I can see your face now. You do have a face and just a head. <laughs> I, I might leave it there. I'd be ashamed to fall out before we started. Uh, <laughs> I can't go the other way, Murray, because it's into the kitchen. I'll have to tidy it up. <clears throat> yeah, that, that becomes a bit of an issue, Martin, when we're doing these. <laughs> you pick a room, you think, now, which one's the least messy? <laughs> That's a reality, all right. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're now all live on YouTube. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi, just a reminder that Mark, um, Nicole and Malcolm, I've just copied you into an email. Thank you, Deborah. Kira, Shane, how you doing? How are the kids? Are you on mute? Old mute, yes. <laughs> Kia ora, Sophie. Yeah, good. Uh, yep, the family's doing okay. We're all positive. Oh, oh well. Hope it, hope it passes quickly. Fortunate for hybrid. Oh, well, we're not even hybrid. We're um, full virtual. So, yep, we're sitting right, currently. Positive sitting. and tested positive. And upbeat as well, David. Yes. Cool. Mm. Oh well, get well soon. Anything you want to Not too bad. Direction. Yeah. Oh, well, it haven't been too bad. Actually, the household hasn't been too bad. Um, I think we've been through the worst of it, so that's quite good. Yeah. Um, that's what we're finding. Yeah. We're losing a lot of staff at the moment, but it's mainly through household contacts, and yes. particularly coming out of the schools. You know, a lot of staff are, are self-isolating because kids have come home from school. With, um, with COVID. And that's exactly how it started for us too. So yeah. all of the circle that we know are now the same. My, uh, my, I saw an email earlier. My kids' class has 11 kids in it today. They'll be laughing. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I did everything I could to avoid getting COVID because Katie and Nau were coming over last Thursday and I thought, I'm not going to see anybody. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. Went over the coast. Painted the roof on my batch and did a few things. Refused to meet anybody. Got back here, felt a bit off colour. I've got COVID, so I honestly don't know how I did it. And I'm we're obviously I I've got to keep a distance from the little girl that I uh, haven't, you know, um, she's in the house. But I'm sort of keeping as far away from them as I can. And at this point, the the three kids haven't got it. You know, it's not her Katie and baby, but you just wouldn't you wouldn't believe how you could get it. To be honest with you. Thank you. Oh, I'm all right. I'm, I wouldn't be honest with you. I wouldn't have known that I had it, except I thought the responsible thing was to check myself on Thursday, you know, when the kids were coming and 
and I was fine. Friday I was fine. Saturday I was fine. It's been good because I had a cold. And then on on Sunday I tested positive. Mm. Um, Sam, we've gone just gone past one o'clock. Right, let's kick into things. Kia ora koutou, everyone. Welcome along to our council meeting today on the 23rd of March. Uh, we'll open with karakia and council uh, affirmation. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai, ehi aki anā te atukura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihei mauri ora. And the councillor affirmation, let us affirm today that we as councillors will work together to serve the citizens of Selwyn District. To always use our gifts of understanding, courage, common sense, wisdom and integrity in all our discussions, dealings and decisions so that we may solve problems effectively. May we always recognise each other's values and opinions, be fair-minded and ready to listen to each other's point of view. In our dealings with each other, let us always be open to the truth of others and ready to seek agreement, slow to take offence and always prepared to forgive. May we always work to enhance the well-being of Selwyn District and its communities. We will. In progress. We will. We will. Uh, the agenda, uh, the agenda today uh, has been circulated. Uh, uh, everyone, everyone has been available, available on the one that's what the grant grant will be between the two phones. Two phone. uh, so the thank you, Grant. The as I said, the agenda has been circulated uh, and is available online. Welcome to anyone that's joining us uh, virtually. Uh, it's getting annoying how often we're having to meet uh, virtually at the moment. It's going to be great to be able to get back into the room with one another um, and do these do these face to face. We're really looking forward to it, and we'll understand a bit more about what um, the announcements this morning mean for for council meetings um, over the coming days. Uh, there is no apologies that I've received today from anyone. I think we're all present for the meeting. Um, there's been no identification of any um, extraordinary business, David. I am not aware of any anything from you. No, nothing received, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, any conflicts of interest that people would like to raise, other than those that are already captured on the interest register, uh, Deborah. Deborah, we can't hear uh, you. Just, just meant to remind. Um that I just sent an email, oh, sorry. I just want to remind um, that I sent an email through um, to you, Sam, with regards to today's meeting um, to confirm that I can participate. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and today we've got quite a long agenda um, ahead of us. There's a number of pages, so thanks everyone for their, their patience and um, conscientiousness <laughs> and being prepared for today. It'll just mean that uh, we'll try and keep our conversations to everyone speaking once um, and making sure we can move through the agenda um, methodically. So uh, let's just think about if we can all contribute to that would be really helpful today. So when it's your turn to speak, um, yes, say everything that you need to and we, we won't be doubling background uh, on conversations. We come to a public forum and it's really great to have uh, Martin Weaver uh, joining us today. Martin, um, you've uh, sent through some Thanks, a, a, a letter and, and things around one of the items that's on our um, agenda today. We allow 10 minutes mm. for this conversation uh, and just allow you to present what you would like to um, our council and council staff that are here. Uh, there may be some question and answers at the end of that, matters of clarification. Um, it's unlikely, well, we don't enter into debate with you over what you're saying. We're here to listen to what you have to say. Okay. Uh, and if there are matters that are on um, the agenda today that we dealt with when we deal with that matter, um, and if there are other matters, we may need to come back to them at a subsequent meeting. So I'll hand the floor to you, and uh, you've got 10 minutes. Ta. Oh, thanks, Sam. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting us uh, to speak to you today. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, my name is Martin Weaver. I am a director of the development company Dunweaver 2020. I'd like to introduce the people with me. I've got Alex Dunlop. Uh, who is the director of Dunweave in 2020. And I, uh, the third director is Simon Dunlop, who is not attending today's meeting, the presentation. I'd like, also like to introduce Ross Mitchell, who is a real estate agent with uh, Harcourts and Lincoln. We engage Ross to market and sell our sections. I'll begin our present 
our presentation and then I'll ask Ross to present his evidence which will support this presentation. As a little bit of background to the Dunweaven 2020 company, Dunweaven 2020 and related companies is a family business which has been developing residential sections for the last 12 years in the Selwyn area. The company has extensive experience in land development in the Rolleston area. Over its history of operation, Dunweaven 2020 has prided itself on pricing sections to allow first home buyers to achieve their goal of owning their own home. We've also supported local builders, particularly in Rolleston area, who return regularly to buy one or two sections from us in each of our developments. I would like to uh, make a comment, uh, as Sam's alluded to, that our pres presentation today further supports the letter we sent to the councillors on the 21st of March, 2022. I would also add that while I have an understanding, I do not pretend to be an expert in the Resource Management Act or Housing Acts. PC 76 is a proposed residential development on East Madison's Road in Rolleston, with the potential for 150 sections a large number of these sections have been pre-sold. A decision on Dunweaven 2020's PC76 will be made at this meeting based on the Commissioner's recommendation. Then we understand the Council will take PC76 through the normal process, including the appeals period. It will then pause the process before the Council makes PC76 operative. A part of the Council's process we would like to address with you in, an, in our presentation is the pause in the process. Today, I would, like, I would like to make you aware of a very troubling and unintended consequence on housing in the Selwyn district. The unfortunate unintended consequence has arisen because of the notification of the Resource Management Enabling Housing Supply and Other Matters Amendment Act and the way that the council is planning to process private plan changes. The Selwyn District Council is considering processing our private plan change 76 and a number of other plan changes in a way that will cause some significant delays in the building of housing in Selwyn, delays of approximately two years. This two year pause will mean instead of PC 76 starting construction in late 2022, this year, construction on this development will not commence until mid 2024 at the earliest. For purchases of our section, sections, there is also an unintended consequence. The owners of the sections in the first stage of our development will be expecting to start building their home in uh, 2023, but will now have to wait a further two years as well. This means they won't be in their new home until 2025. This will result in an unacceptable delay to new housing if this timeline is followed. This will affect all businesses involved in the building industry. We would like the council to make our PC operative without enabling the legislation <coughs> delaying the process. We would like the council to give more consideration to the, the approach they are taking to process the private plan changes. We request that the council rescind their previous decision to include private plan changes in the council variation. Therefore, private plan changes would be excluded from the council variation and unaffected by the new legis legislation. The reasons why we believe that the Selwyn District Council would be, in, but sorry, the Selwyn District Council should treat our, sorry, the reasons why we believe our Selwyn District Council should treat our private plan change under the current process and be excluded from the variation. One, one of the main goals of the legislation is to increase the supply of affordable housing. This two year delay does not work towards this goal. Two, as the council's legal advice states, there is no express power to hold our application. Although the purpose of the amendment act is relevant, it is not the only factor. Finding and purchasing residentially zoned land on any scale in the current Rolleston ODP, ODP areas is very challenging. Number four, PC76 is based on 12 houses per hectare, which is an increase from the original minimum of 10. And the last point, the new resource management legislation 
is an, is an enabling act, not a requiring act. And in conclusion, the directors of Dunweaver 2020 have applied in good faith to the Salwan Council to enter into a private plan change application process. This private plan change process has been well signposted by the Selwyn District Council. But now we find that the goalposts have been shifted and they have been moved dramatically more than two years further away. This has brought on many unintended consequences, not only for us as developers, but for local businesses, section purchasers, and first home buyers. Thank you. I'll pass over to Ross to talk to you now. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you for listening to us. Um, yeah, my name's Ross Mitchell. I've been a real estate agent in the Salon area for about 22 years. And uh, in that time, I've done a lot of work for Twin Visions and um, Weaving. Um, according to the figures that I've been ascertained from the council, is roughly around about 7,055 sections affected by this plan change, by this uh, uh, act, of which uh, 3,940 roughly are in Ross and a couple of thousand in Lincoln and uh, 1,115 in Prevalton. So the, the effect that I'm finding is a, on the, the coalface uh, agent on the ground is that the, um, the, the sales that the uh, directors have done weaving have encouraged me to do. I've always been to go to first home buyers, secondly to mums and dads that are moving up, and thirdly to the smaller one man, two man builders that uh, they'll watch as a number in Rolleston. So the effects on these guys has been actually quite catastrophic really because the first home buyers, they're feeling that their planning and their financing is completely out their door. The building contracts that they have in place- Can you give me a glass um, of water please? that they um, have in place with the housing companies are being extended and the price increases are rocking through. In some cases, they're telling me now they may not be able to afford to build. And then when you look at the, the second category, the mums and dads um, that moving up from a smaller house to a bigger house. And in this particular stage here, we've got a young couple, which this is their third section they're bought through Dunweaving. And each time they've managed to build a slightly bigger house. And, you know, from my point of view, it's always great to see young people moving on and, and planning for their family. But uh, some of these people now, their, their houses have been sold in anticipation of um, getting a position to build or they've got their properties on the market. And now they're wondering what to do. You know, they're going to have to go and rent for an extended period of time. Uh, or do they try and pull out a contract? It's really pretty unsettling for those ones. And then the third group, the builders, well, the small builders just don't have the cash flows to, um, you know, to extend uh, you know, to, to have no work going on of any consequence for a couple of three years. And those that do have the cash flow are finding now that, well, what do they do when they've got their trusses and their framing ordered and you'll all be aware of the, the shortage of building materials, what do they do with those? They, uh, are they, uh, if, if they can afford to pay for them, where do they store them? And if they don't pay for them, they don't get them and then they lose their place in the, in the queue for all their materials going forward. So really, you know, from where I stand, the, the Enabling Housing Act supply seems to have the exact opposite effect that it was supposed to have. So thank you for listening to me. Thanks, Sam. And councillors, that's our, uh, pretty much our presentation today. Um, I'll hand it back to you, um, Sam. Thank you, Martin. Thanks, Ross, uh, for that. Uh, this question for me is, your submission is more about the delay um, then the decision today. Um, exact, that's exactly right, Sam. That's exactly right, yeah. Cool. Yes, Thank you. it's the future. future um, if, if today's successful for us, um, uh, it's the, the pause, it's the future, the time going forward, the delays, yes. And we just wanted to make the, the councillors aware of these unintended consequences. And as you can see, we've talked a couple of times about how dramatic it is. Um, so we just want to make the councils aware of that and, and see if we can um, work towards some solution. Thank you uh, for that. And yeah, we too have been caught, well, councils all around the country were caught by the government um, or both, both major parties in, in, uh, in government agreeing to this Enabling Housing um, Supply Act and uh, obviously having to deal with it um, pretty, pretty promptly and quickly. So uh, it has certainly changed things in conversations this month compared to the, where they were six months ago um, yes. and heading forward. 
Are there further uh, questions or clarification that uh, anyone else has for Martin or Ross? Uh, Nicole. Thanks for that, um, Martin. Um, just clarification. So looking at that piece C76 on what's in our agenda piece today and can see, so the hearing was held on the 1st of November and the decision just came out on the 7th of March, but sort of bef before the hearing was held, the uh, government had already started making moves on this new supply housing and supply Bill, did you have any advice about how that mark may affect you? No, we didn't, and um, it was uh, it, it's a, a consequence that um, we we weren't able to predict, and it's come. It wasn't the intention of the legislation to hold up um, processes. In fact, it's that they're trying to speed up uh, the processes in, through the legislation. So uh, our consultant, uh, it was, it was um, our consultant who we've been working closely with, it came to them as something new as well. Um, and it was, a, it was a surprise to us. Okay, so, um, so your consultant, you got legal, you didn't get legal advice on that possible change that the government was proposing? No, well, actually, we were following down a private plan change yeah. process, and okay. uh, it, it, as you can see, it, it wasn't uh, there wasn't uh, a lot of detail around that, and, and in fact, uh, if you I've noticed on the council website, and, and Sam's just alluded to this, that things have changed quite quickly. That. Only recently there's been information about the intensification on the council website, for example. So to add the short answer to your question is that we, although we, we, we didn't have information to um, make any difference to our uh, application, I'm not sure how we could have changed our private plan change because we were linked into a, uh, a process. So I don't know the... Uh, there wasn't any really, unless we went to select committee or um, something like that. I'm not sure where the process for us to actually make any changes. And we're not the only private plan change, as, as Ross alluded to. There's a number of, um, and, and some of them are, are much bigger players than us. Well, thank you for that, Martin. Hmm. Thanks, Nicole. Sophie. Kira, gentlemen, thank you very much for your presentation. Just a quick question, hopefully. Um, at what point, when when did you start selling sections? And have they all sold, or is this just a partial sale so far? Or, yeah. I'll give you to Ross. Yep, yeah, I think so. We started selling those, I think, around about uh, October, August to October last year. And yes, they're basically all sold. Thank you very much. Great, thank you for coming in today and um, sharing that with us. Uh, councillors will uh, seek some further advice with this on the re um, with this report further on in the agenda, and I'm sure our staff will um, have some comments to make at that point in time. But Martin uh, and Ross, thank you for your time uh, today. Kia ora. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, councillors, before we move to confirmation of minutes, I'll just also note there's two um, pieces of correspondence that I've received um, in the last 24 hours that I've circulated to councillors. They're letters from Nai Tuhuriri um, Runanga and also from Te Taumutu. Uh, they, there was some discussion about them coming to a public forum and in the end uh, they've decided to write uh, to us. So I'll just enter those into the meeting here. They'll be recorded in the minutes uh, as a matter of public record and uh, councillors have all received, um, have received those. Uh, so the, the, conf um, the confirmation of minutes from the previous meeting, uh, do I have a mover and a seconder from the meeting on the 9th of March, Councillor Alexander and a seconder, Councillor Lyle. Um, any discussion on those minutes, Councillor Alexander? Thank you. Uh, just the, there were two, two parts of the resolution from item five, the potential stock water closure the last two clauses need to be added to a matters under investigation. Um, 
because the fifth, the final one was that the decision was to be deferred until council has heard and considered any further submissions. So that needs to be tracked under matters under investigation. Cool, thank you for highlighting that, Mark. Anything further in those minutes? Shane. Yes, Kia ora, Sam. I just wanted to know whether there's been any update uh, from the District Health Board regarding the uh, Ellesmere and Darfield hospitals. I have not received anything uh, directly from them uh, as an update since that meeting. Uh, I'll just note, though, that we do have a member from the District Health Board joining us in the PX part of this meeting, although those hospitals um, is, has not been part of the briefing or the agenda that they're expecting um, to update us uh, about. Thank we you. get back to um, matters under investigation, though, to keep a watching brief on it, Shane. That's uh, fine to add in there as well. Thank you. So we've moved and seconded that the minutes are true and correct. All those in favour, please raise your hands. And anyone against, speak up now. Declare it carried. Uh, we move on to item seven, and it's the Chief Executive's report. David, I'll hand to you. Mr Mayor, thank you, councillors um, and members of the public. Good afternoon. This is an information report. First item is in respect to the proposed district plan change variation, which is a very complex issue, and Tim and Ben are online if there are any questions in respect to that matter. Second item, I've just brought everybody up to speed with the roading improvement updates, and this is for the benefit of those who haven't been on Rolleston Drive and Tennyson Street recently. Our contractors are making very good progress, uh, and the resurfacing stage is set to begin shortly. Traffic lights are already in place. Night works are commencing, or commenced actually, on Sunday of this week, and they'll keep going for a further um, two weeks. Over the page, very successful operation in terms of dispensing rapid antigen tests. You might be interested to know that in the first two weeks of operation, uh, there were 90,510 test kits uh, dispensed to people through that facility. So uh, it's really, really doing beneficial work for our community. Happy to answer any questions on any items in the report, Mr Mayor. Thank you for that. Any questions from councillors? Grant. Uh, just a matter of process, Sam. The first item relates to Dunweaven, I suppose, and how we might. Are we going to speak substantively later on in that on that matter? Yeah, we are. Yep. So leave that to later. Okay. Thank it's you. It's item um, nineteen on the agenda, Grant. Yeah, I just wanted to know where we were going to debate it, so I'll, I'll leave it yeah. then. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, anything further for David? All those in favour that we um, receive the report and approve the additions and alterations to the delegations manual as presented, please raise your hands. And anyone against, speak up now. Declare it carried. Thank you, David. Now move to the solid waste report, Andrew Boyd. It's on page 20 of today's uh, agenda. Andrew. Hi there. Um, nothing too exciting to report, really just um, uh, taking the report as read and um, here for any questions at all that might um, come to light. Great. Thank you for that, Andrew. Grant, your hand, I think, is still up from before, or maybe you had something you wanted to say on this report. Thank you. Uh, Mark. I was going to say, happy to move this, and I think it needs highlighting that we had no uh, recycling loads rejected in the last quarter. I think that's actually a commendable thing for our, our residents to note that they've done, they're doing a very good job on their recycling. Thanks for that, Mark. Nicole. Thanks for the report, Andrew. Um, I've just got one one thing I'm just going to raise with you is the um, the end section about the views of affected slash consultation and what has been listed on climate change considerations. And um, so you put the decisions and matters in this report are assessed to have low climate change implications. Um, 
I mean, I would take a contra view for that because I would say waste management can and does have significant climate change impl implications. So I'm not sure where we're going with these, um, just as a general comment I'm directed at you, but um, where we're going with uh, um, answering these things that we've got listed as being the views that we're looking at, because there are, are reasons that why we are requesting this information to be part, as part of the report. Thanks. Sure. Um, just, just on that, I guess there was nothing within the report that was going to um, make a significant change to um, our, our district's waste effects on climate change or uh, in, terms of, in terms of positive <clears throat> or negative. So um, if I had been proposing a specific proposal within that report that was hopefully going to have a, a positive impact on, on waste or, or if there was something that was going to have a negative impact on waste, then I would have um, probably altered the um, the commentary in that section. Yeah. Great, thank you for that. Uh, Shane. Uh, kia ora, Andrew, thank you very much. Just um, noting at the page, top of page 21, uh, fire, uh, uh, general waste due to a fire on board the collection vehicle that uh, found the cause of that and also mitigated steps in place for that happening again. <laughs> Andrew, you're on mute if you are talking then. Rookie mistake. Um, yes, I'm just trying to recall what that one was caused by now. Um, I think that one was another battery related, uh, expected to be battery related. Um, so uh, we've had two battery related um, truck fires in the last, say, quarter, and one at the transfer station as a result of batteries. So. Um, I'm hoping that um, with the strong uptake of the battery recycling um, system that maybe we'll see that really drop off. Um, that's, that's what we're hoping. Yeah. Thank you. Great, thank you for that. Mark has moved this report. Is there a seconder? Shane, thank you very much for that. Um, all those in favour, please raise your hands. And anyone again to speak up now? Declare it carried. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. The next report is a transportation uh, monthly update, and I'll hand over to, our, uh, to Graham and Andrew uh, online. Thank you. Uh, yes, good, after, good afternoon, everybody. Look, I'm just going to um, move through this fairly quickly. I don't think there's anything too much further to report. Uh, you had a good update from the Transport Agency on a couple of key matters. Uh, this morning, and probably maybe the only thing I will touch on is just acknowledging the discussion and advice I've been receiving from councillors on uh, the proposed uh, submission on PT options um, on the Environment Canterbury proposed 22-23 plan, so I appreciate that. Um, the submission will now be drafted up and added to all the other components to put together to the wider submission and um, uh, talking to uh, David Ward uh, a couple of days ago, uh, we we're on track to do that and get that information uh, through to you sometime next week. Thank you, Andrew. Are there questions for Andrew as part of the report? Malcolm. Yes, uh, section 5.3, temporary road closures for Anzac Day. I was unaware that the suggestion was made that um, these would be uh, instigated by the individual township committees who are having uh, ANZAC parades. Um, I do think it's quite an onerous um, uh, thing to put out to impact onto small community groups that have very little funding to have to um, choose an STMS contractor to write them a traffic management plan when the council previously has done it for them. Um, are we doing this as a cost-saving matter? Because I don't think it's really serving our communities. It's my question. Yeah, I have to defer that to, to Graham. That's in his section of the report. I'm sure he'll be able oh, to... Sorry, Andrew. On. No, that's all right. Answer your questions, OK? Graham, shall we just come to that in a minute? Uh, we'll just go through any questions that we have of uh, Andrew's part of the report. Thanks, Malcolm. Grant. Um, just a question... If you can advise me on the Tancred Road ceiling, it seems to have been sitting there for an extraordinary amount of time with the road closed. And I noticed yesterday it was covered in, in tree clippings that someone had cut the hedge nearby and covered it in hedge clippings. Are, are we getting close to getting that sealed and operational? Can you confirm that? Um, 
I too wish to speak on the NZ thing. Do you want me to speak now or later on on Graham's please? Yeah, thanks, um, Grant. Look, I'm, I'm not up to date with that. I really haven't been down that way for some time. Last time was a couple of weeks ago, um, but I can certainly um, check in on that because it would have been my expectation that it should have been finished by now and open. So I'll check on that and get back to you. And we'll come back to the ANZAC piece with Graham in a minute. Grant, thank you. Uh, Mark. I just think to be to, to the public are informed, we should note that <clears throat> It was a briefing to council this morning with Waka Kotahi and that the public consultation on the NZ Up projects is due late next month. Um, they're going back to some affected stakeholders before then, but the general public consultation is late next month. And so we're unable to make much further comment until they bring that consultation to the public. Thanks, Mark. Deborah. Thank you. And my apologies. Um for not showing a picture. I'm in a poor reception area. Uh, look, just with regards to Anzac Day, um, this would be the first time ever that um, there'd be a request, I think, for an STMS contractor of their choice to write a traffic management plan. Um, it's always been um, undertaken by the council. But this year has caused some con um, just some issues with regards to the government policy around um, the tiered system with COVID. And given the announcement with what's going to happen on the 4th of April, um, that large, large gatherings are able to happen, um, could we actually have a stance on whether, as a council, we are just going to reinstate the whole of our formality of how we ran every ANZAC prior to COVID, ANZAC day prior to COVID, because I think it would be really, really helpful for um, our communities to understand um, what they can have and what they can't have. Thanks, Deborah. And we'll get to the ANZAC piece uh, with Graham in a minute. Uh, Shane? Uh, kia ora, Andrew. Just regarding 4.5 council of requests, and I see that um, Yourself, Your Worship, has contacted James Cagle uh, regarding next state highway review, and I, I wonder how that's going and if there's been any response so far. No response that I've received. No, and I failed to raise it this morning. We all failed to raise it this, uh, this morning. Last time I spoke with them, sorry, so no, I don't have an update. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Graham, I'll hand to you and you can run through your part of the report. Thank you. Good start. Afternoon, all. Um, yeah, keeping it uh, short. Um, the Rolleston Town Centre New Roads, um, two names have been put forward by the Runanga. Um, they've gone forward to Linz for approval and when we hear back from them, a report will be submitted for a decision to be made on that. Um, I'll cover the ANZAC after I've heard all the questions. Um, uh, road, roading maintenance um, and renewals, the big issue there is cost escalations. Um, this is going to have a significant impact on what we can and can't do this financial year and probably next. Um, just something to be aware of, really. Thank you. Thank you. Grant, did you want to raise your um, question that you had before around ANZAC as well for Grant? It was really in support of um, Malcolm's comments because the, the, the reality of these, these um, events, and, and Deborah will back it up, is there's not many veterans left, and if they are, they're very, um, you know, at an elderly age. And it's really, it is really a, a council event that we run now um, to try to get the community to organise it. Is, is um, if I put it bluntly, nonsense. Um, let's get back in the game plan of actually delivering a service that our great players want. And, and you know, I support Malcolm completely on that one. Thank you. Thank you. Graham, do you just want to talk through the process then that you're expecting everyone to follow around ANZAC closures? Sure, this, this is something I've inherited, so not 100% sure on. Um, but my understanding is that uh, the townships paid for this already through, we've got a separate GL that the council um, provided. Um, a lot of people complained about the cost of the traffic management, saying it was too high. And then I think Mark Chamberlain decided that that's fine. If people feel they can get it cheaper somewhere else, that's my understanding, but you're happy to investigate further. Thank you. Sophie, Murray and Mark. 
Kia ora, Graham. Um, so, yeah, my, I kind of got a question. With, so it's really good to see this new um, Think Before You Park Considerate camp Parking Campaign and Development. Um, I quite like that idea because we do have some rather inconsiderate parkers. But, um, and just wondering if there is any possibility of sneaking in somewhere there, I think, before you drive um, for, <laughs> for people living in our, you know, who are, if the majority of journeys are less than two kilometres um, within our townships. So, you know, that's that might actually help with our parking problems if cars are actually left at home. Um, but that said, that would have to be linked in really with, it would be good to link in with some of the other departments like um, uh, the arts, culture, like lifelong learning part and maybe sort of traffic management and building inspectors because quite often it is larger vans that park up on the um, footpaths. Um, and the other question was, it's partly to Andrew as well, I'm not sure if he's still on the line, um, just echoing Nicole's previous comment, this is another report which has nothing directly applicable under 8C climate change considerations. There is going to be always something in the transport space that even if it's a, a rehash of things that are still ongoing, like it's, there's always something that's applicable in this space. We should really be seeing it every time. Thanks. Thank you, Sophie. Um, Grandma and Andrew, I'll come back to you at the end of this, or we'll just gather all the comments and questions from councillors and then come around. Uh, Murray. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Hi, Graham. Yeah, appreciate you've inherited the, um, the ANZAC issue, but it just, it seems to me a wee bit like a knee-jerk reaction. Um, perhaps we should really, as soon as possible, contact those and see whether that is their preference. And if it isn't, we continue on as, as we have in the past. Um, I, I take Malcolm and, well, everyone's point really that there is not necessarily the skills there all the time or, yeah, or perhaps the technical skills and computers, et cetera, to, to uh, necessarily get this through. Um, so leave the rest of that unsaid. There's not really an answer to that other than perhaps we just need to be in contact with them and see whether that is their wish. Um, just with regards to road naming, um, there's a recommendation through from Rolleston Residents Association as well. Is it still, I mean, we, we endorse these road name changes, but I, I was of the understanding now that that was actually just a, it was a, a formality that it came to us. We're not actually approving those anymore. That's a staff delegation. Or have I just got the wrong end of the state? I think Murray, you can comment on that. At the end, we'll come back to you, Murray. Thanks, Murray, for raising those. Um, Councillor Alexander. Thank you. I was also going to question <clears throat> that particular road naming because we seem to have two options, go with the locals' preference or go with the Runanga preference on the, on, on the naming, naming for that road. And whilst it can be done under staff delegation, I wonder whether it'd be wiser to bring that one back to council because of their quite divergent um, views potentially on that one. Um, the second one, and probably the more important thing, the Think Before You Park campaign, I would suggest that we partner with schools and sports clubs on that one, because it's sports clubs that are generally, it's their patrons and their visitors that are causing the biggest problems on Saturday mornings. And schools, because it's their parents who are causing the problems around schools. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy with schools. Parents want to drive their kids to school because they, they, they perceive the environment to be unsafe, which is caused by the parking of parents bringing their children to school. So whether we can further partner with schools, try to get either that they park slightly further away or even better, that they uh, walk, their, walk, cycle, scoot their kids to school and don't drive at all. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Nicole? I second the comments that have been raised about the, the whole parking thing. You guys know that that's been a beef of mine for many years, actually. Um, what I was actually putting my hand up to start start with is, um, and Murray's Washington has as well, is, is Murray Lemon's comment. It is developers that send through to us their names that they want for their development. Now, this case, we are the developer so we need to have a preference of what name we want as council. So that's the distinction between it. And I mean, and by Murray's hand, I think he agrees with what I'm saying. That's completely different notion. This is not us 
choosing a name for a random road in someone else's development. This is a road that we are putting in. We're our responsibility to name the road. So hence why this is how it's going, the route that it's going down, which is quite different, but it's not because it's actually the process is us being the developer. I hope that's clear. Thanks, Nicole. That's, uh, that's good. Uh, Shane, uh, last comment, and then we'll wrap this up from staff's point of view. Thank you. Uh, kia ora, Graham. Thanks very much. Um, 5.1, uh, corridor management, how and why, um, a question there. Um, how and why was it unacceptable and dangerous? Uh, 5.2, thanks, Murray and Nicole. Clear clarification there. 5.4, just noting the $1.2 million uh, escalation increase costs and um, perhaps there's relevance to 5.1 on that. And also 5.6.5, uh, leased and footpaths. Do you have any further information on that? Thank you. Great. So we'll just circle back now to answer those uh, things. Thanks, councillors. Murray, Graham and Andrew. Murray W. Sure. Yeah, hey, thank you. I just wanted to uh, close out that discussion about the road naming. Uh, yes, uh, Nicole was correct. Uh, we were the developer middle of last year when that was discussed with the um, renaming of what was the Wordsworth Street um, extension of that point. There was a request by councillors to get uh, names from both uh, Naitahu, uh, from Tamutu, and also to refer it to the Rollison Residents Association. Uh, it took a long time to get one of those responses, and we only received that last week. Um, I'd be quite happy to exercise my delegation, but I actually believe it's probably something council does have a, a greater interest than my delegation. So we're happy to bring back a report at an upcoming, probably at the April meeting, once we've had the Lynn confirmation that the names are acceptable. Thanks for that. And I guess that'll be part of a property report as part of the development rather than a specific road and transportation piece. So it, can, it could go either place, Murray. No, it is actually a roading delegation. Even though we are the developer, council still makes the decision on the name, not the developer. So it should be part of the roading report, if anywhere. Thank you. Graham, is there things you wanted to say and follow up? Uh, there are a couple of things. Um, Regarding corridor management, Shane, I'll get back to you on the detail of that. I don't have it to hand right now. Um, Anzac Day, yes, I'll definitely further investigate that and and hopefully resolve it. Um, and then there was um, the road, uh, the uh, thing before you park. Yes, um, Sophie, I'll definitely get hold of you to discuss that further. Um, and then the considerate parking campaign, we're throwing the net really wide there. That's, that's going to be handled by the, the compliance, building, planning and road safety team. And there will also be the comms, lots of comms going out. So it's definitely going to all to sports organisations and schools. Yeah. Um, Graham, do you know about Tancred's Road as well, the ceiling? Uh, no, I don't have any information on that. Uh, I could add a wee comment to that, Grant. Um, I sign off on road closures uh, just to make sure that we aren't uh, tripping over ourselves. And I got a, um, I think it was last week, the contractor requested an extension of time to early April just because of delays with uh, rain and other aspects. So that's the expectation that the road closure will be in place to early April. And by that stage, I imagine the road will be sealed. Great, thank you um, for those updates, Graham, and taking a, a proactive response and approach towards ANZAC Day and the communities that um, you're given today's announcement may want to rethink what their um, views are around gathering uh, on ANZAC Day. Uh, Mover and seconder that we received this report. Bob and Jeff, thank you. Uh, all those in favour, please raise your hands. And anyone against, speak up now. Declare it carriage. Thank you. The next item is the property transactions update, and Douglas and Craig are on board. Douglas, what's yours? Uh, 
And we can't hear you, Douglas. Um, Sorry, is that, is that better? It is, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, I'll just take questions, Your Worship, on the report just for brevity of time. And so there's a number of items here that have updated since the last report. Are there matters that you'd like to raise with staff uh, now? Uh, Mark. Thank you. With the escalating costs on Mead Hall, will we get to a point at which we have to reassess the viability of the project? That's one question. Uh, Reed's Pitt, as I copied you on an email yesterday, Douglas, the, can we confirm the opening times? Is it July? Uh, is it August? Do we have a, a, a more com concrete, confirmed uh, point at which it'll be accessible for the public? Thank you. Douglas, we'll come back at the end for you to answer those things that are raised. Uh, Deborah? All right, thank you. Um, just concerned about some of the projects that we've actually um, got ourselves involved with um, and the shortage of building materials. Just wondering how much of an impact is it actually on our future planning um, and design of some of these facilities? and those also that we were involved in partnership with. Thanks, Deborah, uh, for that. Are there any further questions or comments that people would like to make on this report before I hand back to Douglas? No, Douglas, yours. No, thank you. Uh, Mead Hall, uh, that is a project and we identified through a budget workshop recently that has got larger and, uh, than we had anticipated. So that might be an item, as we said, for discussion that we wish, might wish for you the Council of Review. Uh, I mean, it is it is part of our ongoing network of facilities within the district, um, but we do have a wee bit of time in terms of resolving seismic issues. Uh, Reed's pit, I think I've not looked at the page, uh, Councillor Alexander, but there is a, a time uh, table in there. I'll get some exact dates. Um, I did notice today contractors through the pit doing their plant out and spraying uh, side of things as per the program, so that's good. Material shortage, um, I think we're very fortunate and we don't have any um, major buildings at the moment any under, under construction. The next one coming up is a shortage to be tendered change room at uh, Birches Road, it's part of that Pebbleton Park. That, that is an item where just the staff looking at how we might need to manage that particular part of the next stage. The car parking and the landscaping is reasonably uh, straightforward in times with building materials for change room. So we are just looking, being mindful of cost, so that we're just looking at how we break that project up a wee bit in case we have to reduce its size and scope because uh, of cost and sh shortage of materials. But at this stage, we don't see anything um, of problem to us. Thanks for that, Douglas. I'm not really wanting to circle around too much, Mark, but if you've got something I'll to add on that. Just one through the question. We had a committee that met and decided on a name for that Birches Road Reserve. Um, that name seems to have escaped and is not being used. I just wonder where that got to in the process. I think we had Naitua Hiri were um, a little bit concerned about the name we had chosen, but we had confirmed the name. It wasn't Birches Reserve. It wasn't Prebleton Reserve. I uh, just wonder where that's got to in the process. It doesn't need an answer today, but it would be helpful to have that resolved. Thanks, Mark. That'll be noted, and uh, Douglas and the team will follow up uh, on that. Ta. Um, do we have a mover and a seconder that we receive uh, this report? Mark and Malcolm, thank you. Uh, all those in favour, please raise your hands. And anyone against, speak up now. Uh, declare it carried. Thank you, Douglas. Uh, the next item is Five Waters Strategy Review, One Water. It's item number 11, and it's on page 41 of today's agenda. Uh, Murray, welcome along uh, to the meeting, and I'll get you to talk to your report. Thank you, Mayor Sam. Kia ora, everybody. I think I can probably summarise this report simply by saying that we seek to review the 2019 Five Water Strategy but I think it's actually a bit more significant than that. Um, this strategy is a district-wide catchment-based approach. We're moving from a five water infrastructure focus to a wide, wider hydrological water cycle approach. This strategy will give our people a say in water management, um, regardless of what the reform outcomes will be. 
And maybe most importantly, this is um, a, a process which will allow co-design and partnership with local iwi. Now, Sam, I've got a PowerPoint presentation. It's in the report. Do you mind if I just run through those slides quickly or? Yeah, yeah do that, Murray, thanks. Okay, I'll just quickly um, try and share my screen. Hope that's come up. So um, this is, can you see that, Sam? Yes, we can, thank you. Perfect. You've got the landscape uh, 3D. Uh, so it's our one water cycle strategy. Yep, that's right. Um, so I suppose just to provide a bit of context, um, and everybody knows the hydrological cycle, we learned that at, at high school, um, but this is in our cell and context. And because it's a cycle, we can start anywhere, any, any part of it's a start and, and um, it never really stops. So at the top of the catchment, we have um, precipitation rainfall into our headwaters, our mountain catchments. This runs into our, our rivers and for Salwan, um, it's the Salwan River. We also have the Rakaia um, and the Waimakari River um, on either side of us. In terms of integration with our five waters, um, we have the water race intake coming, coming off, uh, feeding farmland, stock water, but also for biodiversity reasons as well. On the bottom of the slide, we have a picture of a water race as an example, and this is one that's in Sheffield. One of the key parts of our water race network is its leakiness, um, and so we lose um, a lot of water through that process. And I suppose the loss from the water race is a gain to our groundwater systems. So as water is lost through the water race network, we then um, extract that for our townships. And this is um, a deep well, for example, in Rolleston, and there's a picture number two, which uh, illustrates that. Our township uses this water, and then the wastewater from our township is then treated and processed at our wastewater treatment plant. And photo three is an image of our Pines wastewater treatment plant just outside of Rolleston. Uh, we also have uh, storm discharges from our, our townships and in places like uh, Dun Sandal and Upper Plains, all that stormwater is discharged to ground and helps replenish our groundwater systems. As you move down the catchment, our townships like Leiston and Lincoln um, discharge their stormwater into treated wetlands. And these then flow onto our land vanish network. Um, photos of examples of that is in photo four and five below. Ultimately though, all water, whether it's um, used, extracted um, or disposed of, makes its way down to Tiwai Hora, uh, Lake Ellesmere, and then the cycle repeats. So the purpose is to really show that this is not about individual five waters, this is a whole catchment approach. Um, all waters are integrated regardless um, of, of the user. Moving to um, slide two, and I'll rattle through this reasonably quickly. <clears throat> Our water strategy in 2009 focused really on that infrastructure, drinking water, wastewater, stormwater, land drainage, and water races was infrastructure focused. We also had the Canterbury Management Water Strategy, which looked at a slightly more broader approach. Looking through the lens of, um, of reform, you may question, well, what's the purpose of looking at our strategy now when we may be having our services taken over by another water entity? What I say to that is that our one water strategy actually is, um, uh, is, is, is applicable regardless of reform or not. It's a, a blueprint for our future. Um, and it's a way that our, our community can speak into how water is managed. So if it's a water entity looking after drinking water, wastewater, or if it's our district council, the strategy will uh, inform either entity um, to manage water in a more efficient uh, way into the future. I'll skip slide three and move straight to slide four. Just in terms of process, um, if the re recommendations are approved to that council, um, the first process will be to engage with Mana Whenua. Um, this is a co-design partnership that we're looking at doing, and the strategy will be developed with us and um, Mana Whenua. We then have partner agency engagement, which will be likes of Environment Canterbury and other key stakeholders. We develop the strategy, and then the important part here is the community engagement towards the end, which leads to our one water strategy. So I think that's probably um, what I'll say. Um, perhaps with tongue. In cheek, I would just say that we do cover climate change in our reports under section 6D, and this um, strategy is really important and will speak into our climate change focus. Uh, well pointed out, Murray. Uh, your points points for the water team uh, on this one. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the report and the recommendations that you've brought to us. Um, even the idea of um, five waters, which is one of the headings in here, <clears throat> and three waters, which comes up, regularly since the government has um, pursued this reform that it's um, 
that it is, uh, is a concept that was foreign to me before I was on council, and I think remains foreign to a lot of people um, as terminology, and it, it really speaks to either the breaking up of water um, and treating it um, how we might with particular treatments or particular bits of infrastructure or the separation of water. Uh, and actually what we're trying to work towards now is using te mana or te wai principles in treating water as water uh, and thinking about, yes, you've talked about the life cycle really well there, um, but how connected everything that we do is uh, to water will form a key part um, in the space, as well as obviously the treatments that are required by the various entities um, into the future. Uh, Nicole pointed me in the direction last night of um, someone speaking in town, uh, Dane and Summoned, uh, and talking about the historical way of um, councils treating water has been um, the, the splitting up of things in a hierarchical, um, how can water be used? I suppose in communities looking at how water can be used um, rather than water having inherent value um, in the first instance and actually needing to look after that. Uh, and since this report was, um, you drafted a, a briefing for us, Murray, I have spoken with uh, Naitu Hureri um, Chair and the Chair of um, Te Tomu too, who are both um, really keen to partner with us uh, in this process to co-design um, the route that we would uh, go down and to think about um, how that would form um, a part of the outcomes uh, from this as well. So uh, we have we have their support today is looking for our council to um, support that as well before those finer details will start to be um, discussed and talked through. So thank you. Uh, we have Grant and Murray, Sophie and Nicole. Um, it's with pleasure I, I move this motion. Um, I think it really is a far, far superior um, solution to what's being suggested, particularly in the next paper coming forward. Um, probably if you look back and look at that the 2009 paper, I think it might have been authored by Hugh Blake Manson, I think it may be. But um, really in its time, it was probably leading edge and almost um, rubbish, but now you, you, you'd advise it as prescient really in, in how you would manage a catchment, particularly under the CWS principles that have been put in front of us. And I think, you know, you talked about um, Damien Salmon talking about use and inherent um, viability of water, but use, and look at use of water and looking after are not mutually exclusive. And I think this, this, this whole um, five waters review strategy is talking about a whole of catchment approach where you bring all the parties together, which, which was the CWMS's goal. Um, and I um, see that as the way forward for our catchment, particularly with such a large area, both urban and rural, that um, it's not just a cell and district council issue, it's not just a, um, a iwi issue, and it's not just an ECAN issue. If we can all um, come together on it and treat it like um, Murray describes, you know, as a catchment from the mountain to the sea, I think that's a really, really um, be great outcome. So I'm, I'm really pleased to, to move this motion. All right, thank you for that, Grant. Is there a second? Uh, Murray, your hand's up next. Are you looking yeah. to second that as well? Yeah, well, I was, and then Grant, Grant's articulated that really well. I absolutely agree with all the sentiments. It's, um, you know, having been involved at the end of the, you know, the, the zipper for CWMS, it was the beginning of a journey, and that whole integration with, um, I'm just thinking of the value that we got from sitting around the table with EWI, with landowners, with, with you know, partner councils, um, was absolutely fantastic. And this is this is the obvious next step to me. Um, so I, I just think it's, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. And look, we, we're about to debate three waters next. Um, but, you know, we've made the assumption at the start of this that, you know, this is happening regardless of the outcome of that. And I think that's just a, a wonderful statement to make about the future of water and the future of our communities involved with it. So absolutely support uh, everything about this paper and look forward to the journey. Thanks, Murray. Sophie. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I've got two questions. Um, one of them is on page 93 of our agenda, um, which I think is 48 of the document. Um, the last sentence just kind of stops. And I'm just wondering if it was a mistype, mistype or whether there's part of the sentence that's been deleted by accident. Um, it says council has the opportunity to strengthen its relationships with its community, therefore investing responsibility. Should it just be responsibly, full stop? Yeah, I can't find in my report on the slide, but let's, <laughs> let's go with what you said. That, that sounds great. Uh, yeah. I was just, just wondering if there was like some major key thing because it was the end <laughs> of the section that we we're suddenly missing. Um, the other question is, um, 
on your the um the consultation or the development framework i would be interested to know if you'd be able to maybe bring the community engagement part earlier or maybe have it twice a wee bit because it seems we you know we we get caught in this ourselves quite frequently that it feels like the community are the last to know and the last to get asked their feelings about some pretty major changes um, and yes quite often you don't get that many of them actually engaging at this stage but it's good to have that opportunity earlier on um, because I agree with, you know Manafanua would be great to engage first just because that's some quite key ideas in that space but it would be great to know what the community feel before then going to partner agencies and then you probably have to come back to everybody. It ends up being a bit of a round robin, I know, but you you really don't want to get caught back into that cycle where everyone's like, well, you've decided already. So what's the point in me taking part? You, you want to ask them while it's still in formation. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie, Nicole. Yeah, thanks for that. And, um, and I agree with um, Sophie's comments about the communication, like community, front footing that a bit early, earlier on and um, Sam good to hear that you like listening to that um, video recording from that was Dame Anne Salmon but um, I've got to Sophie's got to take credit that she reminded me that it was on because I completely had forgotten about it and um, I'm so pleased that it, I had a look at it so quite happy to share that with anyone else who's interested now um, and I also want to make comment about um, that's such a, a good graphic for that first figure that you showed us, Murray, about the whole One Waters thing. And I mean, really, there's a few of the things that are in pipes, the, the drinking water and the wastewater that are quite easy to sort of see where they're going. But when you look at combined with stormwater going into land drainage, going into wherever, it's, it makes it such a complex system. And um, so it's, it'll be interesting to see where we go from, from here. So my question though is around, so your um, consultation and you've put partner agency en engagement, e.g. Can uh, Canterbury Regional Council. So are the zone committees going to be directly spoken to as well? I mean, they're obviously referenced in the report as the Canterbury Water Management Strategy, and you talk about the zone committees, but just wondering if we are actively going to be consulting with them or taking it to more to Environment Canterbury. Thanks. Great, so, um, Sam, I'll just answer those two questions. So in terms of engagement, um, I've, I've taken the notes on that, and we'll see how we can weave engagement with the public the way through that process. There may be certain points where we can pause seek feedback, uh, make sure we're heading in the right direction and then carry on to the subsequent stages. In terms of zone committee, absolutely, they're gonna be critical um, as part of this process. So we'll make sure we have um, targeted consultation and discussions with them. Thank you for that, Shane. Yeah, kia ora. thank you, Tenera Tato. Uh, thank you, Murray. Uh, agree with Sophie regarding uh, community involvement. I think that's essential as owners of, of the asset. Um, also with Grant, I think this is a fantastic document. So um, congratulations to the authors and the co-authors that put this document together. It's definitely a blueprint uh, and and really caps encapsulates our unique voice, uh, which we're about to speak to in the next paper. So thank you very much, Murray, for wrapping this all up and renewing this because it's, uh, well, it was ahead of its time, obviously. So appreciate that. Um, I've just got a question regarding recommendation B. Uh, we uh, appreciate and thank Mana Whenua involvement. Um, I'm just curious on um, the financial implications of this agreement. Uh, it is woven through the document that uh, Mana Whenua will need resource and funding in particular uh, areas. So what does that look like? Um, and uh, sorry, I've just got another one here. Just dealing with my technology. Um, I think I've covered it, mate. But also, there's a there's just a spelling mistake on page eighty seven. It says um, uh, lo losers, I think, instead of losses. Uh, thank you. Perfect. Well, that, that spelling mistake was obviously there as a as the test to make sure everyone had read the paper. So well done. You get the chocolate fish on that. In terms of budgets, um, we have made specific. Um, 
uh, provisions in our budget for next financial year to cover those uh, costs for local Rinunga to be involved. Yeah. Thank Murray, you. thank you for uh, presenting and for the work done to date. Look forward to the next stages. Um, we had a mover and seconder. All those in favour of the recommendations in the paper, please raise your hand. And anyone against, speak up now. To clear it carried. Thank you. The next item on today's report is on tab 12. It's the three waters update. It's five recommendations. And I'll hand to uh, David. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillors, firstly, acknowledge those who were involved in the preparation of this report. So what I'm going to do is make some introductory comments incorporating key points from the staff report and then talk to the reasons behind the recommendations in the paper. And we start out by reminding ourselves that we've been on this three waters journey for a considerable period of time. We've asked a lot of questions, particularly of government agencies, on behalf of our communities. We've recently received answers to those questions, albeit in my mind, there are still some key issues which require further clarity. The recommendations in the report centre around reviewing those answers, identifying where more information, in my view, is required, and focusing on our strong local voice to progress cell and issues for the benefit of our communities. And there's a number of assumptions along the way that we've agreed on through our work on the matter, and they include, firstly, our support for Taumata Arawai, our acceptance that further investment is required nationally on three waters, that iwi have an important role in these discussions. Uh, we've talked about privatisation and acknowledge that uh, that is off the table and also support for ongoing environmental outcomes. But equally, we need to acknowledge that there are some things that remain of concern to us, including our overall disappointment with the process and the lack of communication from central government to communities justifying the proposed change. And remember, this is a central government proposal. It's not a local government proposal. And we have difficulty in seeing any near-term benefits for our cell and district residents. Costs are increasing and households can expect to pay more. In our view, current government rules, monitoring and enforcement have not been up to an acceptable standard. Council wrote to the Minister for Local Government in October 2021, outlining our response to the proposal, and you've seen a copy of that uh, letter attached to this report, containing a number of questions which remained unanswered or under-answered. Uh, a response was received recently on the 7th of March 2022, and again, that is attached to the paper, and we have to consider whether those responses do actually satisfy our concerns. In the report, we've identified a number of matters for further consideration, including financial impact. So remind ourselves that we will be transferring assets with a combined value of over 700 million on the 1st of July, 2024, if this proposal proceeds. The transition requirements for that transfer are quite onerous and will take considerable time, which we don't believe is fully understood because it's not only the assets that are transferring, but the liabilities attached to those, a review of the service agreements that we currently have in place, and consideration of land use arrangements, particularly where assets are transferred, but the land that they operate from or on remains in the ownership of council. We're also concerned about the value of stranded overheads, which are normally applied against these assets. And in our financial um, review, we believe that that's in the vicinity of 2.4 million in the initial year, albeit that will be diminishing as years go by. We've got concern over staffing resource impact, noting that there's a shortfall of staff and three water services right across the country at the moment, and those staff members will be in very high demand from councils as we continue to deliver our work program through to the 30th of June 2024 from contractors and consultants looking to add to their staff and, of course, the proposed entities who are looking to populate their organisations. Councillors are very familiar with the concerns that I've previously expressed and to collection and use of development contribution money, a matter which remains outstanding. We also require further clarity around the cost impact of bringing private schemes, of which there are a significant number in our district, up to whatever the acceptable standard is expected to be, and more importantly, where the cost of that activity is to be borne. 
and we've expressed concern about some of the financial assumptions that have been made in national modelling scenarios, noting that the costs for households are projected to increase. And it's extremely difficult though to make accurate financial projections for periods 30 years from now. And yet a number of key statements are based around what the cost is gonna be in 30 years. There's also a lack of understanding on exactly what an appropriate charging regime for three water services will be. And from a selling perspective, we need clarity on that, given that we currently provide some of the cheapest three water services in the country, and we want that to be preserved. We also acknowledge our strong relationship with iwi and the part they're playing in three waters discussion, but also across a number of activities benefiting our district. And so to the recommendations in the report on page 132, and these are written acknowledging a number of risks that are identified in the staff report on page 138, specifically around satisfaction levels, clarity around the cost for rural schemes, charging regimes and DEVCON's uh, impact. So we acknowledge the first recommendation is to receive the report. Uh, the first significant recommendation is that council reviews the 47 recommendations from the working group. And that working group report is attached to the staff report. Importantly, it was prepared after the working group heard submissions from a number of presenters, including Communities for Local Democracy, who presented to the working party in late January 2022. I've circulated to you all a very good analysis that was prepared by the policy staff at Taituara on those 47 recommendations. And at some stage, we need to take time to consider the responses. That may be beyond the time frame that we have allowed ourselves uh, today. And if that is the case, maybe we could ask the Three Waters Review Group that was established at the strategy day to review this on council's behalf and report back at the future meeting. And that could also be extended to include the responses that we got from DIA, which are included in Appendix B to the report. Recommendation three is a reaffirmation of council's previously stated position, which goes back to our October uh, letter to the minister. Recommendation four requests that council staff continue to pursue with vigor answers to those outstanding matters that I believe are crucial to our ability to assess whether indeed there is any direct benefit to our district from the government's proposals. And it's extremely difficult for us to make any comment on financial impact when, for example, we don't even know what the charging regime is proposed to be. And finally, recommendation five has been written on the basis of preserving our local voice at the discussion table. This council has always been of the view that the local voice was important and we must recognize Selwyn's unique position as a fast growing community with relatively new infrastructure and advantageous pricing models. Councillors have had the opportunity three weeks ago to hear from representatives from Community for Local Democracy and other presenters and also read responses to questions posed, particularly around ability to speak freely on reforms. So as we note in the report, staff do not support council joining communities for local democracy, as firstly, we want to continue to use our strong voice to positively influence the transition unit. Central government formed this unit and has made key staffing appointments. Councils continue to receive requests for information from the transition unit in respect to staff related matters and their anticipated time for further engagement. And we've responded to those requests from the transition unit and will continue to do so, but importantly, promoting key Selwyn issues that we need clarity on to assess the impact on our community. We've continued to hear from the Minister of Local Government that it's her intention to proceed with government's three waters proposals, and the Prime Minister has confirmed that the three waters legislation will be completed this year. And we need to think about how we use our time wisely, given all of the pressures on our sector. The Working Group on Accountability, Governance and Representation have already considered and either picked up or dismissed matters uh, raised by the Community for Local Democracy in their presentation in January. The fourth reason is that we will continue to work within proposed legislation to achieve the most beneficial outcomes from our community. And finally, we acknowledge statements that have been made by Naitahu in respect to um, recent decisions. 
So, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to stop there. I'm sure there's going to be a number of other contributors on this uh, project, and I and staff are happy to answer questions on any aspects of the report. Thank you. Great. Thanks, David, for the background and for um, the report that uh, has been presented today. Uh, I'll just start by um, it's been a 20 year conversation around change and reform. I and I have, um, as part of a meeting where a letter was read, uh, as if it was written yesterday from uh, a minister to local government talking about the need for change. Uh, and turns out it was written in 1999. Uh, and so we've been through successive governments since then wanting to see, um, to see change like it's been put uh, in front of us uh, today. And I remember, um, under the previous uh, Bill English government, uh, previous uh, Jacinda Ardern government meeting with uh, MPs who uh, were all talking about how we rationalise and change the way that uh, water services are given to New Zealand. So it's it's been a conversation that is coming from all parts of government uh, and has been been on the radar for, for some time. Uh, but when, when this was all landed last year and when it when it was brought to our attention, the speed um, and the disregard for local government's voice and the change, um, I found that quite offensive, uh, as I know many of us did, uh, and that has resounded around the country. Um, the idea that there is a size and we're just going to land on a size and that number is four, um, regardless of the the amount of extra work that was done um, to come to that number, that wasn't uh, on the basis of engagement with local government amongst um, existing uh, suppliers to our communities uh, and felt like it was landed as a fait accompli rather than as a conversation. Uh, when the advertisements were put on TV, uh, again, very uh, offensive in, in a number of ways, uh, firstly around the community's understanding of where um, Three Waters was at, secondly, thinking about um, treating it in a cartoon fashion um, which talked about an idea without trying to talk about the existing condition of waters uh, in the country and the reasons for change. Uh, and so, again, the government and DIA got everyone's backs up and we have not been able to have sensible conversations since that date as those ads continued to run uh, and uh, yeah, very little progress on that uh, has, been, has been made. So comms, comms haven't been right. And, and there's also been the ongoing conversation about reform and which way was the best way to have this reform. And Three Waters and Resource Management Act reform should not have been the first two things uh, that have been done and been done in isolation from one another and been done in isolation from uh, the Future for Local Government discussion, which quite obviously should have come first. Uh, and even within the Three Waters conversation and the RMA conversations, we're not even talking about the same boundaries. For, uh, for entities and for working together and thinking about um, where, the key, where the key partnerships um, are. So uh, there's, been a, there's been a disconnect uh, right through. Our position has been made clear to the minister uh, that lead has been shared with the community and following this um, meeting, the response that we've received from the minister will also um, be made uh, public with all of the um, other information that we um, are sharing uh, today. Uh, yes, we got answers to our questions. Most of them don't answer things in the way that we um, would have wanted to see them. It's the same with the answers from DIA. There are some answers there, um, but they don't necessarily land on the specifics that we're needing comfort on to know whether, um, you know, to help us even feel neutral uh, about, about this type of change. Uh, we need to be aware that the costs for communities are going to continue to go up and up, and that's whether we stay uh, as we are now. Uh, status quo you know, is not an option. Costs are changing. Regulation will be um, made to happen, and if we're part of a major entity or stay alone or anything in between, uh, costs are only going to increase. And I think, um, da and David mentioned this well, this is government-led, this is government-driven uh, change. This isn't us. And we were particularly disappointed when the government took away the opportunity for the option, which right through last year, we were told there was an optionality um, to reform uh, and, and now there hasn't. I think where, where things have started to go a little bit awry is the uh, conflating um, opposition to change with needing to be part of communities for local democracy. Uh, and, and those two things are quite separate in my mind. 
Uh, and I have been proud of the way that we have engaged with the Minister, engaged with the Department of Internal Affairs, continue to engage and think about transition authorities, how we've worked with Naitahu, uh, and we've done that as Selwyn District Council, uh, and we've voiced our opposition, uh, but we've also constructively um, considered what change could look like. Uh, Naitahu has been very good at um, pulling South Island councils together, uh, led by uh, Gabrielle Huria and uh, Tamari To. Uh, they have done an, an excellent job at thinking about what the future state might look like. Naitahu uh, being no stranger to things being taken from them and thinking about how you leverage change to actually get something that you want out of it rather than um, rather than having it taken. And, and adversarial is not always the best way uh, to land that. Uh, it's felt like in a lot of our conversations, Naitahu uh, has been two or three steps ahead of um, local government uh, and thinking about how they want to influence transition authorities, about how they want to influence where the legislation sits uh, and about their own appointments um, and thinking about having Gabrielle on um, the governance and accountability working group um, that has that has just uh, been passed. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting we've received two letters uh, from our local mana whenua Naitua uh, have written us um, and they state their desire to work with us constructively on the future of water uh, and that is a key part of the last report that we received on uh, Selwyn's water, a one water strategy uh, and Tomutu have um, written and the context of their letter is very similar, let's take a constructive attitude to think local uh, and act together for the future of our water uh, and they both really clearly state that they don't see working with communities for local democracy um, being uh, something that it works for mana, mana whenua and they don't encourage us to, um, to make a decision to, to join them as well. I think uh, one of the other things we need to consider is not only just what we have received to date, but the amount of influence we want to have uh, into transition. Uh, we're expecting that there would be uh, key transition units um, and local transition um, positions talked about soon uh, and uh, I was talking with uh, Gabrielle Huria about that yesterday and thinking how do we continue to make sure that we don't just get Wellington appointments uh, but that we get uh, Selwyn, um, Selwyn's voice into that, that we get Canterbury and the Takiwa's voice into what the Takiwa is going to receive uh, and a key part of the outcome from um, reform needs to be a really understand a really clear understanding of the constitution um, of the organization uh, it's focus on people it's focus on um, our communities uh, and it can't be just an engineering company that's looking to do things as cheaply as possible there needs to be some other outcomes from this otherwise we just end up in a in an electricity reform um, type conversation again uh, and again and we're repeating some things that um, you know New Zealand's stepped through and been through we need to learn and do better uh, than that as we move forward. So um, yeah, I guess that lays some context out. And finally, following today's meeting, I uh, really wanna make sure that we've got some clear statements for the community. Um, we've talked about this in the past so that they can understand where our council sits. Uh, I have said a few things um, publicly, but it'd be great to have something that's a bit more uh, all of us as council. Uh, and we need today's discussion to really know uh, where that's going to land. There may be a difference of views around some of the items that are in front of us, one through five. So Deborah, you've mentioned in the comments and uh, yeah, we'll take each of them um, separately so that people can um, share their views on each one of the five uh, when it comes to, to voting at the end. Uh, yeah, I'll hand over um, the floor to Deborah, your hands up first. And no doubt there's um, some other comments that people would like to make as well. Thank you, Sam. I just wanted to um, highlight that I think it's important that we actually take each one um, individually, given the um, obvious importance um, that you've spelled out, um, both you and David, with regards to, I guess, um, how do we explain our total disappointment? Um, I just hope that Minister Mahuta was actually listening to um, our meeting and your presentation um, to, you know, to this council meeting. Um, and 
yeah so um can we just take them individually and then i'd like to actually have an opportunity to to speak um with regards to each single one thank you uh yeah we can we can do each single one and the first one's just that we receive a report and the second one is looking to review things so and i don't intend to go through the 47 recommendations in this meeting um, so I'm wondering whether there can be some grouping, Deborah, rather than um, five different recommendations. David? Um, through you, Sam, um, can I suggest that with respect to reviewing the 47 recommendations, you pick up my suggestion to get the group we um, established at Terrace Downs to do that work and report back to a subsequent council meeting? Yeah, sounds good. So let's just have the discussion on the whole report. Uh, but when we come to voting uh, at the end, we will uh, take each item for uh, for voting separately. Murray, that answers your question in the chat there. Great. Uh, Mark, you're up. Thank you. Well, David's partially answered my question, which was who was going to review the 47 recommendations. If it is to be that working group, then the recommendations should state that. Um, that, the work, that the working group reviews um those recommendations so it's clear so that anybody reading it in a month six months times knows who it was to do that um i really don't have much to say about clauses one to four um on five i'm not keen on joining that group i don't i think it it, it does as the report says limits us in our opportunity to speak and publicly on these issues it limits us um, and I don't think it's, you know, I come back to my bottom line and all these three waters discussions has been what's good for the, for the residents and ratepayers of Selwyn and limiting our opportunity to engage, I don't see is, is of benefit. Um, I honestly don't see that this group is going to make a difference. The government has determined that this is something they want to do come hell or high water, and it seems that little we can do to stop them. But by actually being able to engage with them, we may be able to get changes to make the best out of a bad deal. So I would support all four five recommendations that they stand before us. Of course, there may be others who've got um, uh, uh, comments to make that may make me change my mind, but at this stage, that's where I sit. Thanks, Mark. And we'll just pretend, I'll, I'll move the recommendations as they are, uh, with the addition that it's the working group that reviews the 47. Uh, and that way we know what we're talking about. Are you happy to second that, Mark? Okay, thank you. Um, any other, uh, Naomi, your screen sharing. Thank you for that. Uh, Grant, you're up. There's a lot of people hanging back, hoping to go after, isn't there? <laughs> Which is par for the course. <laughs> um, look, uh, you know, I hear you, uh, Sam, and I, I, I want to signal right at the outset of my thing that I will be moving an amendment to, to, to item five, that we do join communities for local democracy. So I want to signal that right at the start of what I'm saying. But and the question we might ask is, is why do I feel that we need to do that? And I suppose the fundamental issue, it was two fundamental issues, is, is the absolute abrogation of LGNZ of their role in this and the disappointing, um, well, disappointing would be underplaying um, their ability to actually advocate uh, for us on, on behalf of the government. I, um, I note in the paper, you know, it says it's not the role of, 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 of councils to, to lobby or um, oppose government. No, no yeah, the, the paper writer is right, it's not. But the abrogation of LGNZ, our umbrella body in doing that, has left us in a position where we must. In fact, it is our, our role. We must do this. And, um, you know, I, I really feel um, perhaps disappointed that Mr Crosby, our leader, hasn't seen the error of his ways and perhaps seen fit to resign because it just seems untenable that he continues, but I won't keep going in that path. But um, the terms of reference post the, the proposal put forward were very limiting to the governance groups that were actually working on them. And I think if we just... Let's pause for a moment, and it's, it's kind of ironic that we had that um, Five Waters review paper um, presented to us before, because it just it shows you the scale of opportunity that's being missed by 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 our community, by our catchment, and, and for water services and, and so on. If we took an alternative path, uh, I I cannot for the life of me see why we wouldn't take time to consider that. 
I think, you know, reflecting on our oath even, what it, what it, and Mark talked about it, what's in the best interest of citizens of Selwyn? That's what we talk about when we have our oath at the start of all the meetings. Clearly what's being articulated now by the government, in my view, and it is my view, it's not the council view, is not in the best interest of Selwyn residents. It doesn't speak to our desire to have a catchment-based approach, approach to our water services, a desire to continue to have a real and enduring partnership with Tikiti Tamutu Runanga around their re regeneration of, of Te Waihora. And so to me, the proposal put forward is a very, very half-hearted uh, approach which doesn't deliver for the future we have. And I think reflecting on, you know, we said about the 2009 report written by Hugh Blake Manson, um, which was at the time prescient, but, you know, and I think where we are now with this, this reform currently put before us, I think we'll look back and if it does go ahead and go, gee, we missed a wonderful opportunity to do something different. And you talk about, you know, our voice being heard by staying out of communities for local democracy. And, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, but the reality is our voice is not being heard under our current mechanism. You can talk about advocating and talking to Minister Mahuta, and, but where is the response that you've got from that? Where is the real traction you've got from that down the middle approach? I appreciate the sentiment, but the reality is, is that you've had no response to it. Even the DIA, uh, the, the length of time the DIA took to answer some specific questions about this uh, gives you a very bad feeling about the ability of these guys to run this, this, this amalgamation because they can't even answer you know, very um, straightforward questions with any clarity in, the, in, a, in a decent timeline. So the Wix analysis that actually under, underpins the whole drive to um, amalgamation is based, based on the 50% on CAPEX and OPEX um, savings on both spheres. Um, even the authors see that as optimistic. And even our own staff, when we try to calculate how we would get from our current spending to the Wix analysis, even with four times our spending plus funding depreciation, we don't come close. So again, there's that disconnect between the government's data and our own analysis. Balance sheet separation, which is much being made of, um, but if you look at you know, the page 227 of the reports back, it talks about credit rating agencies specifically standard and pause, considering that these new water service entities would need some form of government guarantee or backstop to, to actually achieve the balance sheet separation they talk of. And even then, they are unlikely to get a better credit, credit rating than the Selwyn District Council currently has. So again, what's in it for Selwyn? We haven't, one of the bullet points doesn't talk about equity of asset transfer. I still consider that a major point for our ratepayers that if we are to join this organisation, that equity of asset transfer must be addressed, um, particularly at the significant balance sheet relief that some organisations would get to this. The ability to prioritise local issues. Currently, we've got Springfield, that's a hot issue. But it is good that it's hot and it's local and we can get on to grips with it. Our, our ratepayers can pick up the phone, they can get on to Bob Market, they can give them a hard time, they can give me a hard time, knowing that at least we can have priority about it. And particularly when you look at the growth-centric um, spaces we have in Lincoln, Rolleston, West Melton, the ability to build infrastructure, timely infrastructure in the right place at the right time could be compromised by joining this organisation. Indeed, the report talks about the ability of these new, new water service entities to prioritise their work plans because they're under competing demands from regulators, GPS, the Tamano to Y statements. The model suggested is unique worldwide in having these convoluted uh, pathways of actually how you prioritise your expenditure. Um, Phil Goff, I think, uh, writes a, a telling letter that he was on the entity review group. Um, and even though he's on it, he wrote a minority letter back saying that Auckland in particular for a number of reasons, didn't join. If you took the headline, Auckland off the input cell one, admittedly the scale is different, but they, the same issues are arising. High growth, uh, the rate payers that are funded and continue to OPEX the, the business are concerned that they retain the control and ownership of it. Communities for local democracy, um, really, what option have we got? Because you can't, we can't back LGNZ, they've let us down, we know they've let us down. It's either a situation where uh, we box on our own, which is, so far has proven to be fruitless, or we join a bigger organisation which has the horsepower and size to advocate to the government and actually represent a substantive port of the portion of local government. Admittedly, all their goals may not align with ours, but a significant portion do, and particularly about outcomes about what the future may look like. 
And I think the report, insultingly, I think, talks about results from the communities for local democracy will not rely on our participation. It infers that we're happy to take the gains um, gained by communities for local democracy, but we're not prepared to put anything in. Isn't that a terrible indictment on Selwyn that we'd rather sit there on the coattails of someone else than actually put some effort in and actually advocate to the government for some meaningful reform? And I find that offensive, actually, to be honest. Hey, um, so one of the key questions really is, what is the problem the government is trying to solve in Selwyn? We don't have that answer. And as David articulated that carefully, there's a whole lot of questions that we don't answer. I also um, noted the Niwi letters. And, you know, I was, um, I value the relationship we have with Iwi, but relationships, as you say, Stan, sometimes have different points of view. And I, I, I thought it was un it was helpful to receive them, but the nature of receiving them on the on the last minute, on the evening before this debate, I thought was very poor form and uh, led me to believe this <laughs> an underhand motive because I, this report has been out for, for weeks. I, I can't understand why that would come at the last minute and seem to be poor process to me. But I want to reiterate, I do not, um, I, I, I really want a meaningful relationship with EWI, but I believe the catchment based approach would be better. I think Sam's points uh, that he made about the RMA reform and future whole government reform should have come first, uh, absolutely spot on. And I think uh, Sam has grasped the nub of the issue is that the government has got the reforms the wrong way around. And if they had any sense, they would pause this reform now and take forward the RMA and, it, and future whole government first, along with letting Bill Bayfield and his organisation have some time as a regulator to truly understand the issues and pinch points that are, that are driving us forward. So um, I will move an amendment and, make, and ask that item five be rephrased to say that Selwyn District Council realises that, that there has benefits in joining communities for local democracy. And we do so in the knowledge that we can also advocate uh, externally on our own, as well as through the communities for local democracy, because I think it's a better bet having two irons in the fire than a single one. So uh, thank you for your time. Thanks, Grant, for that. Um, as far as the amendment goes, the if the vote is lost, the outcome will be that we do join. So the way that it's phrased at the moment is that we don't join. If that fails, then the outcome is we do join. Uh, and we'd, an amendment to the motion that's in front of us won't be a direct negative of what's there. Um, so does that cover it for you? My amendment seeks us to join communities for local democracy. Yeah, so we, I can't accept that as an amendment because it's a direct negative of what's already there. So the outcome of what we've put in front of councillors losing will be the outcome that you want. So we don't need to move an oh, amendment. So, that, so for absolute clarity, if you say, if that motion is lost, Selwyn District Council will join Communities for Local Democracy. Yep, because at the moment we're saying we won't, and if, but if most councillors want us to, okay. then that vote will be lost. And rather than re-debating that again in a month's time. I'm fine uh, that, with that, Sam, as, as long as it's absolute clarity on what that means. I'll, I'll ask David to provide. That, that was my understanding of where we're at. David, is that, um, is that clear? No, I think I'd rather go down Grant's track, actually, and that is allow him to move an amendment. I've, I've, because that will then be what councillors are voting on, Sam. Okay, cool. Uh, you happy to second the amendment, Murray? Is that the hand up? Okay. Uh, the wording for the amendment, uh, you had a couple of sentences there, there um, Grant, but I'm just, I'll paraphrase uh, and shorten it to say that Selwyn District Council joins communities for local democracy. Um, is, that captures the intent of your amendment? Captures the intent, but I want to stress, it does not mean we won't be able to advocate on our own behalf as well. Thanks. Uh, Murray, you have seconded that. Uh, we'll take a debate on the amendment. Uh, and I have Shane and then, oh, Murray, you seconded it. How about you go on the amendment? Shane put his hand up under the uh, substantive motion beforehand and then Shane, you'll be after Murray. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, look, Grant's absolutely right. I, I did hang back and I hang back because I knew Grant would articulate it very well and he's captured largely what I, what I would want to articulate myself and just maybe add a few things. Um, at the start of the report, we referenced decision making based on fact, not perception. Well, the problem is that we're just not getting the facts, Sam, and that's that's the thing that really annoys me. Um, 
that you articulated it very well, the disrespectful way that we've been treated as local government is just abhorrent, frankly. And I remember going to rural and provincial very early in the, in the piece when Minister Mahuta came and, and espoused that there was going to be a new direction for the for relationship between central and local government. Well, crikey, it certainly is, isn't it? Um, it's not, not to the benefit. We've got an, a substantial list of outstanding questions. Um, and we have the, the opportunity, as Grant says, to join an, an alternate way of trying to force this issue. And look, we may not, we may not um, agree with every aspect of that, but we're not going to agree with every aspect of whatever is put forward. And I take on board exactly what Grant says. I think to say, well, they're going to carry on anyway. Well, the opposite is true. LG and Z are going to continue on with their pressure on, on, on uh, DIA and central government as well. So the reverse is exactly true. Um, EWI support, um, we've all had some disgraceful emails from people, uh, racist type emails about uh, involvement of EWI. And it's, a, it's, it's timely to refute those. I am not going to be the poster boy for those views. It is absolutely, and we've just passed the, the you know, our, our five water strategy review. It is absolutely fundamental to going forward that we have EWI involvement. An absolute unnegotiable um, truth. It is, from their perspective, I, 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 I understand a little as to why they're uneasy about that. Um, but as far as not having engagement with the communities for, for democracy, well, it takes a relationship both ways. I know, you know, we've heard from Dan that they have been seeking that. Um, and okay, they might just want to negotiate with one thing, but Iwi in a remarkable position and that they've got uh, to Turity to, to, to drive that. They're going to be in a, in, a, in a powerful position to negotiate regardless of what that outcome is. And I think we've shown good faith to do that. Um, the other thing is the, the commentary around um, the community of local democracy being a splinter group. Well, crikey, we're a bit, I think, as, as Shana said, we're, we're the last council in Canterbury not to be a part of that. You'd almost argue that we're a splinter group in some ways. But I think we can have a bob each way here um, as, as Grant has said, it, it can, it, the process can continue on either way, but it gives us an alternate avenue. And I sort of think when we go to vote these days, we've got two votes. And I can vote for, uh, the, you know, the Green Party candidate as my electorate person, and I can vote at the opposite end of the scale and vote for the Act as a party vote. And it's perfectly acceptable. I don't think any other party is going to actually get angry about receiving my vote. And I think we can do that. Um, so I'm, that's the reason I'm supporting it, Sam. And I, if, if we're outside of the tent with communities of local democracy, we cannot influence that either. So I, I, what worries me is, that, is the idea that we're being told, this, there's a, a conversation these days that become very binary. And I think back to the, the, the war on terror and George W. Bush saying you're either with us or against us. Well, it's just not that, there isn't that clarity in life anymore. There are many, many permutations to these conversations. And I, I think when we start to, um, to, to target it down to that level, it's very, very dangerous. I think we can continue having conversations and support a range of people to do that. We already fragment at um, local government level and break off into zone, zones and regions and rural and provincial and what have you anyway. That's, it's, you know, we're not talking about a splinter group, we're talking about fellow councils that are involved here. As Grant said, you know, even Mayor Goff, who was part of the process is dissatisfied with that um, and feels frustrated by the process. Uh, so that's basically a nub of taken enough time. It's the nub of why I think we can do that. And I don't think that excludes us from continuing our conversation, as Grant has said, as Selwyn District in their own right. I think we can do both. Thank you. Thanks, Murray. Shane. Uh, Tato. Oh, kia ora, Murray. I really appreciate um, your final comments there. It was uh, a arangatira tanga, uh, arangatira uh, outlook. So I appreciate that, mate. I, I would like to firstly commend uh, councillors uh, that brought this finally to the to the agenda. Uh, we remain, in my uh, opinion, in my opinion, uh, on the fence. We have a position uh, that still isn't clearly clarified to our, our constituents. Um, Sam, I've pulled out some keywords from the quarter so far. David, uh, proposal. It, it is a proposal at this stage. And Sam, rationale. Um, I guess there's only really been one councillor 
through this period of time, we've been discussing a three waters reform that's referred to uh, referred to this process as the single largest decision we as councillors will ever make. And I would agree with that. Um, it, it, it really is, and it's been for some time weighing heavily on my mind um, how we go about uh, um, engaging our public. Um, and as the statement at the start of the report says, Council's publicly stated position on the Three Waters proposals is that it will not agree to transfer any water, uh, wastewater or stormwater assets to any proposed new entity without undertaking full engagement and feedback process with the Selwyn community. This still hasn't happened, in my opinion. We've talked about um, uh, distinguished Professor Anne Salmon. I pulled out a couple of her uh, quotations here. In many ways, the logic underpinning Three Waters seems to hark back to the 80s, when both central government and the courts ran roughshod over democratic con democratic conventions. In 84 onward, the government radically restructured key institutions, government departments, schools, universities, ground research, hospitals and the like, as businesses run along corporate lines rather than as public services. Instead of delivering greater freedom and prosperity for ordinary people, as promised, their free market reforms led to the entrenchment of elites and radical inequalities in employment housing, health, justice, and education, with which we are still struggling. The logic of Three Waters governance seems to arise from a rewriting of Tititi, rather than the original agreement itself. In Tititi, there is no mention of races, partnership, fiduciary principles. It speaks of taonga, not assets. It also describes a network of relationships among Queen Victoria, the governors, the rangatira, the hapu, the ordinary people based on chiefly gift exchange and a promise of absolute equality between settlers and Māori, ordinary people, and their tikanga. I consider myself an ordinary person. Hairangatira tanga, or governor, or councillor, is a person, an ordinary person, who weaves people together. The rangatira, tara, the rangatira is not above the hapu or the district. The rangatira must listen to the hapu, the district, in accordance with tikanga, protocol. If they do not listen, they will be cast aside. Tino rangatira tanga then is about listening to people and weaving them together. In its restructuring of New Zealand and with this reform, the government has failed to follow these principles. In my own words, by choosing not to weave our people together, we too are not fulfilling our role as governors. Salwan has still not been consulted. If I was an elected MP, I may have a different view, an entity view perhaps. However, I'm an elected member of local government responsible to my iwi, the district of Salwan the people that elected me. Selwyn District, in relation to the council's statement, has had no consultation with its council or councillors. The statement, it's not our reform, it's the government's, to me is a weak excuse to throw somebody else under the bus and does not alleviate the fact that the assets still belong to the people, not the government. Do I think everyone in Aotearoa has the right to save clean drinking water? Yes. Do I think it should come at the cost of those that have spent their hard-earned money providing this? No. It must be an agreeable, fair method or we will continue to debt load our future generations. As we've already heard, who can afford a house? To take a, a Auckland paraphrase, with ownership comes rights, responsibilities, and obligations. Ownership needs to be reflected in democratic accountability. And this proposal would, proposal would lead to the loss of direct accountability and control for the people of Selwyn over water service, uh, over water service through the elected representatives. There needs to be a local mechanism that allows for shared equity to alleviate the most in need councils of our society in Aotearoa. I believe an alternative such as the council owned plus regulation option offered by the communities for local democracy may provide that. The direction implied today, particularly point five tells me that the writers of the report do not believe based on the evidence we have received this far is in our best interest, our best district's best interest. How is this possible when we don't have the information in front of us? How uh, that we haven't, because we haven't consulted our people. The recommendation is fundamentally flawed. With ownership comes rights, responsibilities, and obligations. Ownership needs to be reflected in democratic accountability, and this proposal will lead to the direct loss, loss of direct accountability and control for the people of Selwyn over the water assets through their elected representatives again. We've been asked to deal with the facts today. The first fact that I have is that Selwyn District Council is the only council in Canterbury currently on the fence, so to speak, with no discernible position on three waters. All the others have currently joined communities for local democracy. So my question is, what are they seeing that we aren't? Why are, haven't we been informed? Or why isn't this, why, what are they seeing? Uh, Salmon District Council has still not consulted their ratepayers. Currently, the Salmon District 
uh, Council and the people of Salwan own the water infrastructure asset. In fact, we have a water strategy called the, that addresses and mitigates all major concerns that are considered compelling by the government called the One Water Strategy. Ultimately, in relation to the first statement that Salwan District Council will not agree to transfer any water assets to a new entity, I would like this council to join communities for local democracy as the only means provided this far for our ratepayers to have their views heard. It requests a, a pause so that we can take our people on the journey and weave them together. I'm sure we will look back on this time and either, as either having the best or most stupidest decision ever. History has provided enough reasons to justify my decision. Lastly, I have three questions. What are the perceived consequences of joining communities for local democracy, including, including every relations? What is un Salmon's unique voice without the ratepayer consultation? And what are we not aware of that all the other councils in Canterbury, all of the other councils in Canterbury are? I, for one, feel we are being mushroomed. Uh, just, and just lastly, I just wanted to put in here in regards to Erie relationships, uh, I very much um, appreciate and would very much appreciate continuing the relationship. We currently do that. We've just mentioned uh, one water strategy that has had co-governance from the start. I'm not sure what does change by uh, by allowing our constituents to pause, reflect, and then take a take a different approach. Uh, under the Ngaitahu Freshwater Policy Statement 1999, water should be managed at the local level because most threats to water bodies are local. Responsibility for management should therefore be delegated to those organisations that have a personal stake in its overall health and condition. Kia ora tato. Kumo to hope. Thanks, Shane. Uh, we're heading towards three o'clock. It'll be two hours uh, for a meeting. I suggest we extend the time of this meeting to finish this item. Um, Sophie, happy to move that. Murray seconded. All those in favour, please raise your hand. And anyone against, declare it carried. Um, thanks, Shane. Mark. Um, thank you. I deliberately didn't comment oh. earlier on, on a lot of issues in this one. I'd like to read from the Community for Local Government response to our questions. The MOU makes it clear there are key points to which members are required to subscribe. If a council member wishes to depart from these principles in their public comment, we ask that they discuss the matter with first with partner councils. If the council nonetheless wants to continue in a manner contrary to the campaign principles, then its best approach would be to leave the campaign. Those statements show that we would be effectively gagged by joining the campaign. We would not be able to have an independent Selwyn voice. We would have to be going cap in hand to those councils in that organisation saying, please, sir, please, ma'am, may we say something different that reflects what we want to say? I don't find that to be democratic. So I don't find, you know, I really struggle with that. The other issue I really struggle with is the two letters we have received from our partnership, Rurangas, both of whom oppose the Communities for Local Democracy group, who have failed to consult them, have not worked with them. And I value our relationship with these two runanga much more highly than I value a particular relationship with this, this group. I think we should remain independent. We should work with our runanga and not, set, not harm our relationship with them by joining this group. I reiterate, I do not see a benefit for Selwyn in joining this group. I see harm, I see gagging, and I will oppose this amendment. Thanks, Mark. Deborah. Thank you. After listening to the debate, how do we change central government's mind? Do we join a group that is if the majority of the councils throughout New Zealand all joined and it was election year, what do you think the Prime Minister would try and do? Modify to be re-elected or to carry on doing what's happening? We're just in a compromised mess, if you want to know the truth, with regards to an autocratic view of centralisation because we can't manage it, we can't do it, 
um, with a lack of leadership shown. Um, and I appreciate the comment. It isn't their election year, but it will be. And I'm just conscious of the fact that um, I just cannot sit there and play nice in the same pit knowing that everyone around us is throwing sand up into our eyes. We're getting nowhere, absolutely nowhere by taking the nice approach. We need to find some way. And I like the proposition that Grant's put up. So maybe what we need to do is, before joining this group, is actually get some assurances that they are going to play nice in the sandpit. They are going to let us talk to DIA as an individual group. Because so far, what sounds to me is that everybody is in their own camp um, and nobody's coming together. Thanks, Shane. I really, really appreciated um, your commentary. Um, playing nice in the sandpit is not going to work. So, Grant, is there any way that you could modify the recommendation to put in some form of guarantee with regards to the fact that um, this, the, the Group for Local Democracy will allow um, a varying um, a viewpoint? That Deborah means that it may have to lay on. That means that it just may have to lay on the table. There's a constitution that communities for local democracy have. It's not going to be up to us to try and change their constitution around what they will and will not um, allow. But that will be a conversation should this pass um, that we would need to have. Sophie. But, but hang on. But isn't that the very thing we're trying to do with central government? Yeah. So good luck trying to change it. I think that goes both ways, Deb, that's what I'm saying. There's already a constitution in place. There's already member councils, the minority of New Zealand councils. Uh, there might be the majority of Canterbury, but it's certainly not reflective around the rest of the country. Uh, and trying to change their constitution after everyone's joined on existing basis, uh, I think would be difficult. And that would be a conversation for us to have should this pass, rather than um, if it doesn't, then we won't need to discuss it. Okay, well, then it comes back to the situation that, you know, we should have actually had this discussion right at the beginning of the three waters and when this group was putting together its constitution. Thanks for those views, Deborah. Sophie. Okay. Um, I'm just going to, so I, I, do not think we should join communities for local democracy, personally. So I think it's important to note that um, all the working groups that have been participating and work with the government, they're not all in for this. Like the governance one has made 47 recommendations and you can bet there was a lot of work that went into all of that. We don't know yet whether the government will um, accept those recommendations, but we do know that they're gonna listen to them. So it's been valuable participating in that part of the conversation. LGNZ isn't all in either. I get that there are feelings of betrayal, um, that they didn't take a stance one way or another, but they were in a very difficult position because they had other councils who did want uh, significant reform. So how are they going to take any stance without betraying somebody? It just wasn't going to be possible. Um, I do not see the point in jumping into the uh, the bandwagon of communities for local democracy just because the rest of Canterbury has. Um, I don't see that they have any more answers than the rest of us do. We're still all asking questions and I do not genuinely believe that taking part in that organisation is the way that we're going to get any answers whatsoever because those answers are being developed by the working groups um, and yes, it's taking a long time, but honestly, this was never going to be a short process. Um, I, so I share a lot of their concerns, but I can't see that their grass is any greener than where we are. Our side of the fence is just as muddly, but at least we've got a gate, you know. Um, looking at the Communities for Local Democracy information, I can see very little 
going in, in their slides that they shared with us and their answers about Te Mano Te Wai. Um, so I, obviously I wasn't the only one who listened to Dayman Zalman last night. Te Mano Te Wai was one of the biggest things that she was concerned with. I can't see anything about that in Communities for Local Democracy's concerns or their priorities. Um, even with the government, I mean, we've just talked about changing our five waters strategy to a one water one to accommodate the fact that this is not purely a pipes discussion. Water is everywhere. It is in many different forms. It is an ecological cycle. Um, I can see acknowledgement of that in the recommendations of the governance working group. I can't see any acknowledgement of that in communities for local democracies work, but also to say against the government, I can't see necessarily where the scientists are in any of this conversation are at the moment. It's mostly infrastructure engineers. Um, and yeah, when you're talking about pipes, yes, stormwater, slightly different. I have a lot of concerns around stormwater and planning issues. Um, I also don't see where social services have been in this conversation because as far as the impact long-term financially, that is a huge concern, particularly for the areas that need extra work. Um, so, you know, but that's that's by the by for this particular debate, to be honest. I also definitely need to acknowledge that, yes, DIA have run roughshod over everybody in this. They've just steamrolled the world. Um, looking at their responses to our questions, I mean, they couldn't answer anything about more detail of the Wix assumptions. They were just referred everyone back to the slides that we've had access to for over a year. It's just a pathetic answer. Um, but I can't see how communities for local democracy will get more answers than that. <laughs> um, and also I'm very concerned that if we join them, we will be locked out of a lot of those working groups. Um, our staff will not be able to participate in the work that is ongoing to try and refine this proposal, uh, the, these reforms, which, yeah, okay, chances are the government are just going to press ahead with it. I see far more uh, good in working within the tent than without it. It's not perfect, but I would rather stay in that tent. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sophie. Nicole. Uh, thanks for that, Sophie. And actually, Sophie and Mark have pretty much covered a number of the issues that I was going to bring up. I have got the same views that they have got regarding communities for local democracy. I, I'm not convinced that we will be able to get a voice. And I mean, they have stated that we potentially, unless we agree with everyone else, we're not going to have a voice. But I mean, seriously, this is all crystal ball gazing. We don't know where it's going to end up. It has been like this all the way along. And one thing that hasn't been mentioned is there's, my understanding is there's a significant cost to joining communities for local democracy. And that hasn't even been discussed as part of this conversation. I might be corrected on that, but um, that's my understanding. And also, I apologize to Waitaki because I understand that they're part of Canterbury as well. Um, and that they don't seem to be on the communities for local, local democracy, but that's um, beside, beside the point. Um, the communities for local democracy, I mean, do we act, we don't seem to have anything from them to show that they've actually made any change to the government. They talked, they said they talked to the government, uh, we have a session with the government on an end of last year but I can't see on their website that there's been anything that they've been able to report from that so for me I mean I think we're better off just to stay as we are if we're looking at Salwin proper we want to give their voice we need to be Salwin as Salwin so thank you thanks Nicole Jeff yeah, I always forget to unmute myself. Never mind. <clears throat> excuse it. Excuse me. You know, I could I could um, talk for some time about this, and you know, like all of us, I have my opinions. And and in this case, we uh, around the table, I can hear that there a lot of our opinions are set in concrete, and and I'm sure my opinion won't sway those that feel one way nor the other. But I kind of have my own thoughts about it, and I. I'll stray a little bit offline and say, well, yeah, and, and it was in the report anyway, that free-flowing water belongs to nobody. 
and 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 that's been upheld, you know, by the um, British common law, uh, which hasn't extinguished uh, Maori uh, rights, um, and nor for North Americans or anyone else. And that's the customary title to to what they had before before the European settlers came here. And I hold that in pretty high regard, and I held it in high regard, and I was actually very conscious of it long before I read this letter this morning, um, which sort kind of firms that opinion that I had up. But thinking about it, you know, one of the things, the problem all has all cropped up, is cropped up because our organisation, local government New Zealand, was so pathetic, so naive, and so poorly led at the start, um, that we are now trying to find high and firm ground. And, and that's because, I guess, we were hoodwinked, which is what something that perhaps local government New Zealand and the, and the good people that were there didn't expect of a government. So there's no winners in my opinion here, but jumping ship because of something that's been created by a poor workmanship for a better word um, at the start is really, I don't think is going to put us in a strong position. So I um, feel very bitter and I think that you've got to make sure that bitterness doesn't cloud your judgment, certainly not going to cloud mine. I don't think that joining Communities for Local Democracy is going to help us or, or clear the way forward for us. I think that we need to make sure that Local Government New Zealand, who are our, our spokesperson between government and, and, and local government, do a better job than they've done. And certainly remember that um, water, every person in New Zealand is entitled to good, clean drinking water. And we must keep reminding ourselves, whereas we're very good here in Selwyn and we're, and we're blessed with really good water, that's not the case right throughout the country. And one, I can see the benefits myself and one authority, two or three, however it's going to be, maintain the overall New Zealand drinking water standard to, a, to an acceptable level where no one's going to get ill. And, and that is what that is the outcome I think that we all seek. We can get messed up in the local politics and who pays for this and who pays for that. And again, you know, we've got new infrastructure that's concerning us that we have to hand it over to an entity. But in 80 or 100 years' time, hopefully that entity will replace what will then be aged um, infrastructure. You know, I was talking earlier on this morning about you know, looking after someone for our kids, our grandchildren, you know, I'm a granddad, and I look. I got a little kid here now, six months old, and I'm thinking, well, you know, you want everything to be perfect for them. I just want the perfect solution for the future generations. And you know, the Salem people, just like uh, you, don't remit, forget that taxes and rates are the same thing. And whether it's a tax or a rate, it's still paid for the infrastructure. So it's not councillors or council money. It's the people of Salmon have paid, just like the people of Palmerston North, Auckland, or anywhere else. Unfortunately, uh, drinking water to me is, is has to be to a standard where any person in New Zealand can go anywhere in New Zealand and drink good water. Any person from overseas can come here and expect to drink good water. Let's forget the politics, the bitterness and all the rest of it and learn from it and go back to what we were talking about this morning. Learn so that we don't make those same mistakes with... Um, government, local government reform. So I'm not against, I'm not, I actually see what Grant's saying, and, and honestly, that's where my heart really is, but I just don't think it's going to work for us. Um, I, I feel angry and want, I would like to challenge the government on it. Uh, if Minister Mahout is listening now, I think she should be ashamed of herself for some of the statements she's made. She certainly hasn't enhanced herself or her government to me as a person. Um, but uh, communities for local democracy, I don't see, is the way forward. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Malcolm. And then I'll get um, Murray and Kelvin and some of the staff that have been involved uh, to, just to give their views, and then we'll um, wrap up with a, with a vote. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Thank you, everybody, for your input. Um, you know, I too am... am, am annoyed at the way in which the arrogant way in which this government has um, proposed this legislation. Uh, it irks us all because we are, we are all involved in democracy. That's why we're here. Um, I guess when you look at yourself, the fact that you have got an ultimate majority, um, yes, they are tracking down on the polls, but I do not think it is going to change 
what they are intending to do. And they are looking at legislation this year, I think, not next year. Um, so bear that in mind. But I was also want to take us all back to a, a, a principle of the common good. Um, you know, we did the five waters um, so many years ago, an excellent piece of work that came there with Mr. Blake Manson working on that. And from that, we looked at um, joining up all of our water supplies and rating over the whole of the community, and that was for a common good. Now, I want you to keep that sort of common good idea in your mind, because uh, no matter whether you like the legislation the government are looking to put to us, it is the common good for the whole of Aotearoa that they are trying to, to bring by aggregating us all together. Um, there's been much talk about the abrogation of local government New Zealand and, and their role in representing us as a council. So if you hit the nail on the head, you have to remember that there are many councils in this country who are in the whole as far as being able to afford their wastewater and their stormwater and looking after their infrastructure. Local government New Zealand represents all of us. The, the, the Communities for Local Government group is a, a, small, a smaller group of the whole of local government New Zealand. And you have to bring it into mind that local government New Zealand represents us all. So they, in democracy, have to represent those who are the percentage, the majority of, of the views within local government New Zealand. So I think we are being um, very unkind to those people who have worked very hard and continue to work very hard. But when the deck of cards that you get dealt has terms of reference to things that are so damn tight um, that it's very hard to move, um, it doesn't make it any easier. Um, the best interests of Selwyn res re residents have been mentioned on many occasions today in this debate, and, and we always bring those forward. Um, and also um, the wonderful opportunity to do something different. Well, I think by not being involved in the communities for local government, we are doing something different. We're still entertaining conversations that are not gagged, as Mark has pointed out, um, from the grouping that uh, we're proposing to join. Um, I, you know, Murray's mentioned we're not getting the facts. Well, what concerns me is what makes you think that the communities for local government have got the mythical magic wand a local democracy rather, that they are going to get the facts. What makes you think that um, their um, grouping is going to have a, is going to be heard? Where is their mechanism for, for conversation with the government of the day? I don't see that mechanism for conversation. And I'm, I'm looking for that. And I don't really think um, they're going to have a great deal of sway at all. Because as we, has already been said, this government has made a decision. Um, we don't like the fact they've made the decision. Yes, it is going to move our assets away. But you also have to remember that we're not shining in the sunshine. Look at the Melvin Hills water supply. How many boil water, water notices have we had in the last 12 months? It's probably 50. I don't know, Murray's shaking his head. It's probably quite a few. Um, but I, I know that, you know, there we are. We There we are. We've got um, a community-owned water system that is not performing um, because we haven't maintained it enough, we haven't looked after it. So, you know, we have to bring that in where we sit as well. Um, we have been steamrolled. There's no doubt about it, we've been steamrolled. And as for the single biggest decision we will ever make, well, it's not a decision we're making, I'm sorry. The decision has been made. The decision you're trying to make here is whether you're going to join a lobby group which you think has got a magic wand and is going to um, magically transform the government into putting a pause on this piece of legislation and um, it reminds me of moving certain influence uphill with a spoon. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I do think that um, joining this group will alienate the local mana whenua, and I'm not prepared to do that. We have spent six years um, the last six years working cohesively with our local Tangata Whenua to create, to create a great relationship and work our communities forward. And I do not want to put that into jeopardy. Um, 
I think um, I'll take you back to, to, to common good. We are doing this for the common good. And that's what we as, as councillors have to remember at the bottom, we work for our people. And I do not believe that um, going into an alternate group uh, and losing our independent voice is working effectively for our people. So I will not be supporting the amendment, I'm sorry, Mark. Cheers. Thanks, Malcolm. Uh, Murray Washington and then Calvin. I just wonder whether Councillor Mugford should uh, go ahead as a staff member. Yep, either or. Sorry, I didn't have his hand up when I said... Oh, okay. Before, so. Do you want me to go ahead? Yeah, go for it. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it's mainly a question of David, really. Um, does he believe that today is the right day to make this decision before we get the answers to the, um, or the recommendations from our committee for the 47 questions. Are we jumping the gun and doing something before we possibly get some of the answers that we already, that we're asking for? I don't know, it's just a question of David. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, yeah, um, Bob, I do believe today is the right day. Um, yep. There's been a process and a working group that's considered a whole lot of uh, proposals to them in late January, they've come out with their recommendations. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Bob, do you have it? Okay, thank you. Murray, and then Calvin. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to speak. It's um, been a very interesting discussion, one of the more interesting ones I've heard in the time I've been here. Um, I've, and this is start from the staffing perspective. Um, we're operating under a regime of incredible pressure on our staff in terms of uh, a pressure to uh, stay with council. You know, there's offers being made everywhere. We, it has very, been very hard to recruit people into the sector for a long time anyway, as you'll be aware. And we're doing that under a, um, a specter of raising standards and a lot more intense monitoring and compliance being brought in by Tamata Arawai and Environment Can and Regional Councils. And the transition will mean we'll have challenges over and above our normal day-to-day -day, uh, work. So it's a very uh, difficult time for staff. And as best I, we can, I would not like to deflect the work of staff into, into areas that aren't to the benefit of our customers. At the end of the day, that is all we're here for, is the long-term benefit of our customers. Uh, my personal belief is that the uh, change is inevitable. Uh, that it will happen, and we're to make the best of it. Uh, in terms of like the 47 recommendations from the working group, very nice, but mainly around governance. They did not touch or do not affect the fact that there will be four entities set up to run water and that as our assets will effectively be put into another organisation. So uh, that does, the 47 is a... a we have the tinkering around the governance, but doesn't affect the uh, prime um, motivation of the reform. I'll just touch on something that I had written down, which Malcolm has actually covered. 2015, we decided for a long-term plan process that some of our community would not be able to afford to provide services in the, in the next 10 years from that date because they just couldn't afford to fund it themselves as a single community and we had had a number of cases where in a vain attempt to keep rates down communities were actually uh, directly impacting on us doing the right work because they felt they didn't want their rates increased so we disfrutized we disfrutized within that six or seven years least in stormwater Hararata stormwater potentially springfield drinking water, all of those will actually get the benefit of scale, of equalisation, and uh, uh, that actually maintains an equity for our rate payer, and that's the whole purpose we did that. Now, looking at what the uh, community, um, community for local government, um, I haven't seen any proposals from them that would provide the same equity amongst all New Zealanders for good water services. What I'm hearing is they would like council controlled organisations of say two or three councillors who are quite well off to work together. That's great. 
but I believe that will leave a significant number of our communities around the country stranded in terms of good, uh, good, um, good resources to deliver projects. And I think the minister has actually noted that that um, she couldn't accept any proposals that uh, would leave regions stranded while others were okay. So, um, yeah, I think that's probably all I need to say. Um, I don't didn't see anything from the um, CLDG that showed that they had an alternative proposal uh, different than what the government has proposed. Thanks, Murray. Calvin? Thanks, uh, Sam. Look, I think there's two things that we're all in agreement with, and that's one that we need to make sure the quality of drinking water and and the infrastructure that takes away our wastewater is is of top notch to for protect people's health. And the other thing is that the reforms proposed, um, we're not fully in agreement with, but it is such a substantial proposal that I don't think anyone would be fully in agreement with anything like this. These have will always have pluses or minuses, things we like, things we don't like. And, and for those that are a little bit more well-off communities, probably see themselves as being quite comfortable at the moment. And we've been fortunate that we've developed rapidly. We've had the benefits of our infrastructure effectively being subsidised by those developers who have come in, paid their development contributions and contributed to these assets. If we then fast forward 30 to 40 years and we might have a stable population with ageing infrastructure, will we still be able to hold our rates at a lower point to recover those costs? And we're also really seeing, as we saw last week through our discussions around annual plan, the impacts on our water's costs they're starting to rise, there's pressure on them. We're not immune to the, the water issues as has been raised. Um, we've got the Springfield situation at the moment. And yeah, we've got a community-wide rate where we're willing to share that, but we seem to be not so willing as councils, and I'm speaking about this in a general New Zealand sense, to actually share that burden amongst ourselves and as Malcolm probably said around that greater good piece I think that's really important to think about how that moves forward. Um, looking at the proposals and the the, the toing and froing between uh, the various groups and criticisms of financial modelling within them and I look at the modelling that Wix put up and, and I don't necessarily agree with the views of some of their assumptions uh, I, I think uh, probably overinflated some of their potential savings. But the one thing is they do predict that costs will go up regardless, and, and that's fact. I look at then some of the opposing council's views and some of their financial modelling, which I've seen, is also a little bit ropey and not factoring in the longer-term costs of running these assets. And one particular council that I did look at uh, had no, review, uh, no renewals out beyond about six years. So there does need to be some balance in that. If we look at what we can gain out of moving to communities for local democracy, yes, there's a cost involved, um, but our voice is probably somewhat stifled and we don't get the same thing. There are situations currently where some councils in that group are refusing to cooperate at all with DIA, which I think is uh, petty at best and in something that we would certainly not want to be involved in and putting our best foot forward. Whether we, whether we agree with the changes or not and they're put in place, our task as uh, officers and staff of this um, community is to do the best for the community with what we've been dealt in front of us. We might disagree now, but if legislated, all we can do then is do our best for the community and drive that forward. And there's plenty of other things coming up which Remaining in the tent, I think, is highly critical for us. So we had the, the discussion earlier this morning around um, future for local government. I would be very surprised if some of those councils in the um, local democracy group will get a look in and discussing a lot of those things with great, um, uh, with with any any great force. Um, people get petty and we'll keep people out of those conversations. And yes, it might not be the right thing now, but in the long run, we want to be staying engaged with this government, whether we agree with their decisions or not. Um, 
look, I it's your to, it's the, the council's decision and the staff will will implement. It, but I um, I agree with Murray that you know another we're fairly well through on this. It's like buying insurance when your house is on fire. We're probably a little bit late in getting to the game on this one. And if we want to oppose it in the way with local democracy group, that it would divert a lot of attention of staff away in other directions. Thanks, Sam. Great, thank you. Um, and Grant, we'll come back to you as the uh, mover if you'd like to have a right of um, reply. I just think about the conversation we've had uh, in the last hour. Um, I think the first issue for me is around we all 100% support the one water strategy. Um, and if we want that to be successful, it has to have mana whenua co-design uh, and working together on it. Uh, they have quite clearly stated that um, making a decision to join uh, communities for local democracy would be hitching our cart to a horse that has a way of thinking, which is I'll come up with an idea and then I'll tell Mana Whenua about it and hope that they come on board with my idea, um, which is not the approach that we're wanting to take at all with the, with the One Water strategy. Um, and I think we would start to see that we're the ones that are driving a wedge between um, Tomoto uh, and ourselves and Naitua Hurere uh, and ourselves. And with all the gains that we've made in the last six years uh, and for all of the good work that we've done uh, with Te Ara Atia and the town centre understanding our cultural journey, um, we would be risking um, the wider work that goes on. The Canterbury Water Management Strategy work uh, with um, the Selwyn Waihora and the Christchurch West Melton Zone Committees, the co-governance and joint work on our land drainage systems. Uh, and I don't think we can just isolate this one decision now and think that there might not be some consequences beyond um, this one this one piece of work. Uh, and it was said, uh, I can't remember who said it earlier, that you know that they see this as the, the single biggest decision um, that they will make as a councillor, uh, but it's not our decision at all, actually. The, the decision as to whether or not there's reform isn't our decision, so um, you don't need to hold that over yourselves. Um, but our decision to step away from partnership um, with Mana Whenua on something that for them, Rangatira Tanga uh, is in the treaty, it's in the uh, Treaty Settlement Act, uh, their kaitiaki role over water um, within their takiwa is, is very clear and for us to step away from wanting to work with them, uh, I think that would be a very big decision for us to make today and something I'm certainly not, um, not happy to do. I think that for some councils, obviously they have seen that their own voice means not enough and they've needed to get together with communities for local democracy. Um, but from what I hear from our council, none of us agree with the water reform as it stands, but actually we do have the ability to make some significant um, approaches to the things that we think need to be changed. And, and there have been those approaches made. Um, the shareholder piece that the um, governance working group looked at having sub-regional um, representatives groups, all these things have been have come up in our conversations uh, and local government representatives have managed to put those now to the Minister for recommendation. Uh, and whether or not they get through or not, you know, that's up to the Minister. But we have had a voice under the current, um, the current way of working. Uh, whether or not it's heard uh, is going to be up to the Minister. But what I'm hearing from those who have listened to communities for local democracy uh, and been on the receiving end of where of of hearing what they would like to see done is that the, the disrespect and the inability for mana whenua to be meaningfully engaged uh, is offensive uh, and doesn't, doesn't help. And so I would not want us um, to be partnered to that. Uh, Grant, uh, Jenny, you haven't said anything. I don't know if you want to, and then I'll hand to Grant for our final Sorry, um, Sam, a lot of what I was going to say has already been said, so I won't take more time repeating um, what I, my thoughts are. Cool, thank you. Grant, write a reply. Thanks, Sam. Um, can you can hear me? Yeah, um, I just can't hear you for some reason. Uh, I... Um, Firstly, I suppose I'd just take a moment to say uh, thank you to everyone for taking serious 
time to think and consider the issues and come up with a range of, of replies, which has been really useful in this debate. Um, but I reflect on how we started this debate. And I guess the, you know, the question is, do you truly believe that the entities or the provision that's being put forward by the government is the best possible outcome for water services in New Zealand coming forward? And that's a fundamental question. I think the answer I've heard repeatedly today from everyone around the table is, no, but what can I do about it? And, and that, is, that is the worst attitude I, I can ever um, believe, is that if you fundamentally believe that it's not the best outcome for Selwyn, well, what do you do about it? And I think, um, you know, people ask, well, what is the mechanism for being heard by being in communities for local democracy? Well, if you look at the geographical representation of the, of the people that are in it, surely an organisation that represents a significant geographical uh, population, including all of Canterbury except Selwyn, uh, large tracts of Otago, including Dunedin. So you, the government, if, it's in any, if it truly represents the people, should look at the ge geographical representation of this group and go, hang on a minute, this Communities for Local Democracy obviously has a groundswell of, of opinion here, which represents a significant population base in New Zealand and should be included in the debate. And you know, what I'm hearing from you and from, from some of the staff is if you join a Community for Local Democracy, somehow or other, you just cut off at the knees and you're not heard again from because you're, you're part of this rebel group. If that is truly the government's attitude, if it is truly the attitude, it's a front page um, headline on any media at all because um, this is the nature of democracy, that you join groups to be heard. And I think um, much has been made of, the, of being gagged by joining this organisation. Nothing could be further from the truth. I spoke to Dan Gordon yesterday, and he said it's the same as a councillor. Now, we have always had the opportunity to speak as we wish. You just qualify it by saying, this is not the opinion of communities for local democracy. This is Selwyn's view. And that has always been the way and it's continuing to be so. So the nonsense about not being able to speak is absolutely that nonsense. Um, I you know, heard Malcolm's common good and equity, and I, I understand that. The challenge that we've got here is that LGNZ, and he, they do represent some people, but they abrogated their duties in signing up to a non-contestation agreement with the government on behalf of all of us without asking us that question. So I think you know, that, that, is, that is a very fundamental piece of the strategy. Mana Fena, where much has been made about disrespectful to mana whenua and, the, and, and I think that's it's almost a red hearing. It's been trumpeted up as by joining this or by debating this, we're somehow being disrespectful to our, to our EWI partners. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you want to have a robust relationship, in any relationship, whether it's a marriage or a friendship, you have to have the ability to debate key issues and have differences of opinion at time about what is the best way forward for you and your partners. To, to threaten that by somehow having a difference of opinion, you're no longer friends, uh, is not a friendship, it's not a partnership, it's not a relationship. So I think that needs to be reflected on as well. So when we think to what Murray Washington said, um, the crux of the matter is there's been no fundamental change to the proposal. The entities are the same size, people are joining are, are the same size, all the assets are in. So although we've been fiddling around the edges with a bit of a wee bit of shareholder um, change, which still has no rights associated, no, no rights to use the equity for borrowing capital or, or any dividend return, nothing of those at all. The representation changes are clunky and all they do is put more people around the table without uh, at one big table. You can imagine the management of that. So my view is, and I still stick to it, is that we should take the opportunity to join communities for local democracy to give us the opportunity to be part of that, that structure, which gives us the opportunity and if the government is wise, to listen to communities for local democracy and have a, a meaningful voice. It gives you two voices, and I can't see why you wouldn't, but um, Calvin's comments about, well, we're a, bit, a wee bit too late, um, and that really sums up Selwyn, doesn't it? Late to the game, but the socks down and no game plan. And, and really disgraceful, really, in my view. And it's, uh, I feel uh, disappointed in our council that we have deferred and prevaricated on these decisions. And it's only now that we're actually having the decision today. This, this should have been months ago. So I, I do feel some disappointment in, in us as a council that we've got there. But um, you know, I, it, the vote today um, may not be close, but I, I feel it's been a good debate. And I thank everyone for 
for putting their views on the table in, in a sensible, debated way. And um, all I can say is that, you know, win or lose, I think that we really need to put all our effort into making sure whatever the outcome and it is the best outcome. And I think, as I reflected earlier, a catchment-based approach with our partners, to me, is a better approach than what's been dished up today. So, uh, Sam, if you want to have the vote, let's uh, rip into it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's come to that time. Uh, so we've got an amendment. Uh, Naomi, do you want to put that up just so that we can see what we're voting on, the change in five, which is that we join communities for local democracy. And then if that passes or fails, then we'll know what we're voting on for the other, um, the other five recommendations. Well, I think, Stan, that if one to four could be passed as a block, so I don't think there's any opposition to one to four, is there? No, I'm just, I'm happy to do that first. Uh, I was just wondering if people are okay with that process. We've got an amendment on the table, so I was wanting to close that off before we move back to the substantive motion. But if people are happy, uh, and Grant, if you're happy as the, the mover of that, we'll move one to four separately. If anyone, speak up now if you're not okay with that. And then we'll come to five, which will be does join. Sam, procedurally, we must deal with the amendment first before we can go back to the substantive motion. That's the procedure. You've got to deal with an amendment before you can deal with a substantive motion. Okay. So we... Yep. Thanks, Mark. So the red down the bottom grant, that wording is the amendment. Okay. Uh, I can't, with that on the screen, Naomi, I can't actually see everyone. So everyone remember that you're voting on joining communities for local democracy. Uh, take down screen sharing and then I can actually see everyone. Naomi, thank you for sharing that. Okay, so the amendment has uh, been moved by Grant, seconded by Murray, um, that we join communities for local democracy. All those in favour of joining, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. And all those not in favour of joining communities for local democracy, please raise your hands. One, two, three, well, oh, I'm sorry, my screen's moving around. One, two, three, four, five, six. So that's um, a dead heat. And I'll use my casting vote to um, not join communities for local democracy. And to clear it lost, we move back to the five recommendations that are there, receives the report. So, so Sam, just before we move back, because I think it's important for the future, that you do have a right to pass the casting vote in that, in that situation. Is that, is, that in our terms, is that in our standing orders? All, all council decisions, yep. That's confirmed by the CE? Yep, thumbs up, David. Thank you. Uh, so one is that we received the report, two is that we asked the um, council review group, which is actually the three water subgroup, as um, at the beginning of the year we set up Jenny and um, Jeff uh, to review the recommendations and report back to council. Three reaffirms its views that the government has not yet communicated the need for and benefit of this reform. Uh, four request staff continue to pursue outstanding information on the rural and private schemes. And five, uh, that we do not join communities for local democracy. Um, I'll just put them as a, well, I'll put them as a, we'll go, we'll go one to four again, as, um, seems that's gone through, if people are happy with one to four, uh, and if you could take down screen sharing, thank you. So all those in favour, one to four, please raise your hand, and declare it carried, and five, that we do not join communities for local democracy, please raise your hands, do not join communities for local democracy, one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. And that uh, against that we do not join communities for local democracy, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I'll use my casting vote to say that we do not join. Okay. Uh, so thank you for the conversation and for the manner of that discussion. Um, we'll take a break. Uh, now that was a long segment of the meeting. Uh, let's take 20 minutes, which will take us to 10 past four, uh, and we'll rejoin the meeting at 10 past four. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sam.
your videos on, Murray, and we can see you organising your office. Your videos on, Murray. We've been able to see you organise your office. But your audio's off. That's probably good that my audio's off, but <laughs> sorry about that. And my office needs a lot of organisation, so. <laughs> You've been there the whole time, Mark. A lot of it, Murray, Bluetooth headphones. I can get a coffee without losing um, audio connection to the computer. G'day, Bob. How you doing? I'm good. You? Oh, right. I thought you might have had the wobblies. You're looking a bit crook before. No, I wasn't good. sure. No, no, good Good today. Oh, good. I sent you a message. I tried to call you before. So I thought, shit, maybe Bob's not too well. No, no. 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 Oh, good. Good, good, good. No. So you're good today. That's good. Yeah, I'll even be better tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. It looks like the sun's shining up there, is it? It's beautiful, yeah. It's like that most of the time up here. Oh, of course, yes. Yes, I, I forgot. <laughs> There's a flying pig just went past my window. <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. We've, oh, um, last we've had our share of rain. Have you? Yeah. Yeah, we've had a bit over the last few days too. Yeah, easterly warm stuff. Yeah. Yeah, actually, it's the first uh, time since I've been here that we've had a real straight easterly rain. Oh, really? Yeah, that came right into our deck, right into the back door. Well, it just goes to show how far inland it went. It's normally we yeah. get it down here on the coast. Yeah, yeah, we so, so normally. Yeah. Uh, very good. Very goodly. Oh, well, four o'clock already. Hell's bells. Good. Good. All right. I'll, I'll sign off for a while. That background's one of my new Anzac flags. I like that flag, actually. Much better than the um, the old uh, Union Jack in the corner. And, um... sure. Yeah. Well, I, I was actually one of the only people I know that actually agreed with the flag change. But uh, that one didn't, wasn't the uh, one, was it? A reminder that we're live streaming still, guys. <laughs> that's all right. Are we? We haven't said anything that's offensive. I know, but just in case you hadn't realised. As long as Thank Mark you, doesn't start singing. Mark doesn't sing. It's interesting. I suppose we, um, Steve and them, can work out how many people are actually online during these sessions and whether we do get a good uh, audience? I think we've had numbers before, Murray, but it, it's not huge, but it's surprising who watches it after the event on yeah. YouTube. It's actually, yeah, it's quite weird. I think it really okay. goes over double digits. Those poor sad individuals that don't have anything else to do. It's surprising <laughs> It's it generally only really gets up to about 12 or 15 actually watching the live stream. But um, as you said, it's the, quite a number of people come back and watch the YouTube video later on. It's yeah, surprising how really many texts I get. During what, the council go back and see if you... No, no. You while, while I'm sitting here at the council meeting, people are texting me to say something about somebody said something. It's surprising. Or to compliment you on the tie you're wearing, Bob. No, no, <laughs> no, not normally, no.
Hey, Murray. Yeah. Um, no, Murray Lemon. I had the uh, meeting for the Biosecurity Advisory Group Canterbury yesterday. Would you like the minutes of it? They're quite interesting. Yeah, mm. I would, Bob, actually. Yeah, that, that'd be great if you've got yeah, them. I'll send it. Yeah, yeah, and I'll send this. There's quite a few reports on rivers and all sorts of things, which... Uh, I thought you might be interested in. Yeah, absolutely, Bob. Um, yep. Yeah, we just had a we had a champions meeting on on Monday, so the first one of this calendar year. So um, it was quite good to get a recap. But um, yeah, that'd be good info, actually. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Share it okay. to all councillors, Bob. Okay. Yep. Ah, oh, Shane, how are you? Hey, am I inside the tent or yeah? <laughs> You're on, the you front your lawn and, you're on the front lawn in the tent, mate. <laughs> oh, you mean like Parliament? Yeah. Oh, no, I didn't mean that. <laughs> I heard something about compliments, so I, saw, I thought I'd jump back on. Uh, just um, inquiring after, you say you're all positive in your house. How, how, have, <laughs> how have you been? Has it been really nasty? Or? Yeah, the girls have... Um, so the um, Amidia got it on Saturday, faint yep. test, and then by Tuesday she was full strength. Um, she's been through the sort of the worst of it. Hannah, we believe, has got it, but good luck trying to shove a blooming uh, thing up her nose because she'll, <laughs> she'll claw your eyes out before you get that close. Our tests, mine and Anna's, have come back um, for the third day yesterday. Uh, definite. <clears throat> they were kind of faint, but faint is a positive. So um, I'm not doing too bad. Anna's pretty crook. Yeah, she's had sore tummy, uh, no, no. Uh, Beating chest pains, but just really out, the lethargic, tries to get up, do something, bang, back to bed. So uh, it's been a bit of an experience, and we're coping with it best we can. We've got friends helping us with uh, groceries and, and bits and pieces. But um, for me personally, overall, it's been kind of like a bit of a flu, a, a weird flu that's a bit makes you feel a bit dizzy. Right. But actually, I was feeling terrible before the meeting. And now I actually feel good. I don't feel too bad. So I've got a hot water on my back bottle. So, uh, yeah. So that's my question, Shane. I've just done a rat test in the break because I've yep. been not feeling good since last night. So it took you three <laughs> days to get a positive test result, did it? Yeah. Well, I we went into self-isolation. Yeah. And according to my rat test, it was up to six days before is, is more than likely when you started to develop the symptoms. Yes. Um, we're all in isolation as of Saturday. So if we test positive <clears throat> during the start day of the isolation, we can still come out if we test clear on the eighth day. Right. Yeah. Regardless so of when you catch it. I believe so, anyway. I hope so. It's kind of confusing. I, but, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I've got it. Just the results oh. showing it because it's, yeah, the symptoms you've talked about are exactly what I've got. So yeah, what, I can spot a mile away. What are your symptoms? Um, yeah, a bit of an upset stomach, but um, headaches, swollen glands, scratchy throat. Yeah, and just generally pretty buggered, actually. Oh, excuse me. And what's the what's the rat test? Is that um, is it was it just a saliva test? Is it? No, it's the up the nose one. Oh, yeah. great! Yeah, and you put it into a fluid and then let it sort of incubate for a bit and drip it onto the test. Yeah. yeah, it's um, it's interesting. Susan Wales did a piece on how to do those properly. Nineteen point three. You got to be careful where you put the bud. Yeah. But um, my sympathies, my sympathies. I mean, all of you, if you, you know, we're all here to help. If we can deliver anything or do anything for you. Well, I don't. I'm not miserable in any way. Um, well, maybe I am miserable. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I feel you know like I've only I've had a Panadol, Milky, and I you know like I. I've been tireder than this and, you know, without being sick, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, so at this stage, it's, it's I would suggest, mild, but it's just interesting to know, you know, as I say, it's come back negative, but I, I'm i pretty sure, you know, I will have it. So I'm going to treat yeah. it. Yeah. I have other friends who've got it and have had, um, one of them's had really bad asthma attacks and um, mm -hmm. had real difficulty breathing. Uh, another one's got this cough that just slays her. So it seems to affect different people in different ways. So all the very best. Um, yeah. Interesting we times. Also have a, a senior member that's also affected. Jeff, how are you getting on? Yeah, Jeffrey. Where's Jeffrey? Yeah, I, uh, I, 
I said, I, last Thursday I had, I was coughing like a really dry sort of a cough. You know, you get a tickle in your throat and my nose was just running. And it was just a clear fluid. It still is. And it's, um, so I did a rat test on Wednesday. It was clear. Thursday, because of, of the children coming from Sydney. And it was clear on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I'm not sure. It might have been sad that I tested positive. So it was, and, and I was probably starting to feel better. But I wasn't sick. I had diarrhea and a runny nose. That's all I've had. And a, and a dry cough for a couple of days. But now I'm feeling, you know, what's wrong with me. And, and if it wasn't for the rat test, I would I, I would have thought I just had a mild cold or something. Not quite right. So I've been pretty lucky, really. Well, I hope that continues, my friend. Yeah, right? yeah, I'm feeling all right today. Yeah, but it's a, it's a strange feeling. Everyone's obviously got different symptoms, but... You know, you, 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 my face feels hot, you know, like I've got a bit of sunburn on it, you know, like a bit of a... I've had a temperature about 38.4, I think I have my temperature was up to slightly. Mm. Yeah. But I've blown um, positive tests. So I think it was Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. I haven't mm. tested myself today, but it'll be positive. Hmm. I will stay well. Yeah, well, I am well. I'm lucky, but it, unfortunately, a lot of people aren't. I, I'm, you know, I can, and I don't know how the, on earth I got it. I was trying to be really careful. That's the way it treats us, isn't it? Mm. Um, it's, it's just gone 10 past four. Okay. Right. Thank yeah. you, David. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us back again for this meeting. We've got a public presenter, David, coming in at five. Is that correct? Yeah, and, and public excluded part of the meeting, Mr. Mayor, yeah. at five o'clock, yes. Great, so let's keep moving uh, through the agenda. The next item is on tab 13. It's the termination of licenses to facilitate sale of Crown Reserves on page 246. Uh, and it's that the council authorises the acquisition and disposals and leasing manager and the acquisition, disposal and leasing officer to terminate licenses over the reserves in tranche one and 2.1 of the Crown Disposal um, we have a mover and seconder for that in the report. Moved Malcolm, second and Jeff. Uh, any questions or things people would like to raise with staff on that matter? Grant, yes. Uh, just want to understand what will happen to the um, the reserves. If the, in the meantime, the grass will get long, no grazing, noxious weeds. Will they maintain the will the leases maintain operating when they've been terminated? Correct. They they'll continue to. Uh... Uh, maintain the reserves until there's a need for them to be terminated. This is just an efficient way of pulling all of those together, uh, Grant, to, to be able to terminate when necessary to achieve efficiencies. Will we need to pay any compensation to these people? No. Thank you. And this is a procedural decision now, but uh, I have an extended family member Leasing reserve tranche 2.1, reserve 3536. Um, this isn't about transactions of that nature, but just for everyone's awareness, there's um, that's, that's there. Happy to step back from the table if people would like me to from this matter. I don't know that it's necessary. Um, any further questions that people have? All those in favour, please raise your hands. Anyone against, speak up now. Declare it carried. Thank you, right. Rob and Douglas. The next item is the Pines Resource Recovery Park design alteration. Uh, two recommendations, uh, including that we, uh, sorry, your designation alteration, so that we accept the recommendation of the independent commissioner and delegate team leader strategy and policy to take any necessary next steps. Uh, Jessica's online, we've got a mover and seconder, Mark and Malcolm. Uh, Jessica, is there anything you want to add into this? No. Great. Any questions from councillors? Uh, Shane, yes. You're muted, Shane. Rookie, rookie move. Hey, um, uh, thank you. Um, just in regards to point five, page two five eight, the extended hours uh, and full realization. Will that is that uh, captured? Um, in the OPEX with the increase in FTE, if that makes sense. Will there be any deviation from the current FTE? I cannot answer that question, but is Andrew Boyd still 
online. He may be Doesn't able to. Otherwise, I can uh, get back to you on that one. Murray Washington, you. do you know the answer or follow it up? No, I don't, but we will follow it up. Okay. Great. Thank you. Grant? Uh, just looking at the map on page 253, um, particularly the side of the new infiltration basin, um, that severely limits the future development of the site. If you were, we have talked in the past about landscape supplies, garden supplies, and those sort of things coming to the site in future. Logically, that entrance would go, the road would go straight down towards where the infiltration basin is. Has that been thought about by the staff about optimising the site for future use? Because um, it is a large scale size site. And I suppose um, part two of that question is should we have used this opportunity and the consent change to actually provide for future use of the site as well at the same time? Thanks, Grant. Uh, Murray or Jessica? Um, the design of the site um, has been developed, obviously, by the, um, the staff involved, not the, the planning staff, but it did come up in discussions as to the future uses of the site. Um, but just because activities such as um, Landscape Supplies Yard would be outside the, um, the extent of the designation that would need to be applied for as a separate resource consent. Um, so that's separate from this process, but it was discussed and I believe it is being um, considered in the future um, by the staff associated with the development of the site. So with Sam, will that be taken back as a message that we need to look at the infrastructure development to make sure it doesn't impede development because that infiltration basin would seem to be squarely where you might want something? Yes, a, and yeah. Murray, you've taken a note of that? Uh, yes, we'll take that back. It's a good question. Thanks for raising, Grant. Any further questions on this? All those in favour, uh, please raise your hands. And anyone against, speak up now. Declare it carries. Thank you, Jessica and Murray. Uh, the next is on tab 15, page 263 of today's report, the Norwood Zone Substation and National Grid Substation Notice of Requirement Decisions, A, B and C. Is there a mover and seconder? Malcolm, Bob, thank you. Uh, is there any discussion or questions on this decision? Shane. Uh, kia ora. thank you. Um, I just wanted to... Uh, two things for me. Thanks for the report and just wanted to uh, commend the Rob, the writers of the report for its fullness and completeness, uh, particularly page 274 and 275, the peer reviews and the uh, incorporation of Mahanui Kurataya. Um, yeah, great, great work in providing a full and robust report. Um, I've just got one question on page 274, a clarity of the statement regarding employees living on site. Um, Bob's away on leave, so he asked me to step up for this report. Um, I do not know the answer, but I can confirm um, and get back to you, if that's okay. Thank you. All good. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, Shane, for that. Any further questions or comments people would like to make? All those in favour, please raise your hands. And anyone against, please speak up now. Declare it carried. Thank you, Jess. Uh, number 16 East, um, is retrospective approval proposals of the resource management system. Uh, it's on page 289, one that we received the report and retrospectively endorse uh, the attachment. Um, as a remover and seconder for this. Sophie, thank you. And Malcolm Ta. Uh, any questions or comments people would like to raise around the submission? There's been none. All those in favour, please raise your hands. And anyone against, please speak up now. Declare it carried. Thank you. Item 17 is the approval to grant easements in West Melton, uh, pursuant to Section 48 of the Reserves Act. Uh, mover Mark, seconder Malcolm. Thank you. Uh, Rob, you've come back in. Would you, anything you'd like to say on this report? No, it's purely procedural. Mm -hmm. uh, Bianca's off sick today, unfortunately. Um, but it's one of those where it cannot be delegated to officers. It needs to be approved by full resolution of council. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, question, Shane. I didn't have comments? to do anything. Ben must have been just shitting with me. 
He's like, yeah, make sure you take him on a journey, oh. mate, from, uh, you know, he's like, the more, <laughs> he's super serious. He's like, yeah, you'll be right. I think we should let that go. This is quite interesting, no wonder. <laughs> Sam, I, uh, I just had one question. Thank you, Rob. Um, page, what is it, 326.9 um, from the report, the 3rd of May, 2021. Um, a late submission was also received from NZDF, but somehow it slipped between our, our processes there somewhere. Uh, SDC's records do not indicate receipt of it. So I'm just wondering if we've mitigated that, that risk happening again. Sorry, what point was that again, Shane? Uh, yes, uh, page 326.9 uh, at the top of the page indicates a late submission was also received from NZ Defence Force. Uh, records indicate that it was sent on the 3rd of May, but SDC's records do not indicate receipt. So there's been a, a bit of a lag. I'm just wondering I think that's the next report, Shane. Yeah. Oh, apologies. <laughs> No worries. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, we'll come back to that, Shane. Grant. I'm scared now. <laughs> uh, assuming that uh, all costs were met by the decided winner. Right. Grant, did you have something else to say there? Sorry, muffled at the end. Uh, sorry, it's trying to use two, but at the same time. Great. Uh, Shane, your hand's still up. I'm guessing that's just for the next item. Hi. Yes. Cool. Uh, although, do we have a mover and seconder for this one? Mark and Shane, thank you. Uh, all those in favour, please raise your hands. And anyone against, speak up now. Declare it carried. Thank you. You're all right. Uh, the next item is tab 18, page 314. It's private plan change 73, rezoning of land uh, in Rolleston. Jocelyn uh, has joined us. Jocelyn, do you just want to talk us through um, the key um, points in this report? Sure. Am I being heard? I often have IT issues. We can hear you. Thank you. Um, plan change 73 is private plan change request to rezone two parcels of land on the former plantation blocks, um, known as the Holmes block and the Scalarup block on the western side of Rolleston, um, facing Duns Crossing Road. The proposal was to rezone these from Living 3 to Living Z to accommodate approximately 2,000 households. And there were two small parcels of business one land also included in the request. Uh, we received the request in November 2020. Council accepted it for um, processing in March 2021, just over a year ago. Since then, it's gone through the required public engagement processes under the Act, the Resource Management Act, and this culminated in a three-day hearing in September uh, before Commissioner David Caldwell. The Commission's recommendation to Council, which runs at over 90 pages, is that the plan change request be declined. Uh, in considering the matters before him, Commissioner Caldwell concluded that, on balance, the plan change request did not achieve the purpose of the Resource Management Act, as set out in Part 2, and is not the most appropriate way to achieve the objectives and policies of the relevant planning documents, including the district plan, the regional policy statement, and the national policy statement on urban development. In particular, in relation to the Homes Block, Commissioner Cord will remain concerned about the potential perverse sensitivity effects on the Pines Resource Recovery Plant and the Pines Wastewater Treatment Plant. While additional setbacks were proposed through the hearing process, Commissioner Cord will consider that the reverse sensitivity effects cannot be addressed in an integrated way simply by the inclusion of extended setbacks as outlined or as shown on the outline development plan. Commissioner Cord will also remain concerned about the matters of urban form and connectivity in particular in relation to this, the Scalarup block, which would be surrounded on three sides by rural land, therefore, therefore being a, a peninsula of urban development extending out into the rural zone. Commissioner Caldor also accepted the position of the consultant planner for council that bringing forward the development capacity proposed by the request did not outweigh the potential risks of predetermining the direction of growth of Rolleston which he noted was not anticipated in any of the relevant planning or other statutory and non-statutory documents. So the recommendation that the, um, the recommended option to council is that the recommendation of Commissioner Court will be accepted and that the plan change be, a request be declined. Uh, happy to take questions. 
Thanks, uh, Jocelyn, for that, and thanks to Commissioner Caldwell for the work that's been done uh, to get this far. Uh, and I guess there's a few things that make sense in the decision, and then there's a few that, to me, just don't quite sit um, when I compare this to the decision made two weeks ago, or four weeks ago, was it around West Melton? Uh, and so, yes, there are decisions here where this sits outside the identified infrastructure boundary. It's in addition to pre-approved and work done with uh, the GCP around the future direction um, of growth for, for Ralston. Um, but it sits right next door to existing infrastructure, uh, school that's there, the state highway that's there, increasing um, our urban uh, living from living three to living Z. Uh, as far as land use goes, um, we, we connected to a town seems like, uh, to me, it's a better land use outcome than, um, than what we had before and understand the reverse sensitivity um, requirements. And we want to be cautious on that because of um, the whole community's reliance on, on the pines. Uh, but in the same way that I don't want to see the airport contours restrict um, development under those contours, sure, we, we need to think about what needs to be put in place to ensure that people that live in houses under airport contours uh, have whatever sound and noise protection uh, and can live in a healthy way. Um, we're sort of taking the opposite view here that actually because we've got a piece of key infrastructure, we do want to restrict everything that might happen um, in, in near or around it. So we set up a process and, and uh, the commission has gone through and I'm not going to oppose uh, what the commissioner has done. I had, wasn't privy to the, the hearings uh, and understanding all the arguments for and against. It just seems to me that um, one decision in West Melton uh, spread out land use not connected to public transport on the edge of town. Uh, this one next door to a school adjoining the state highway uh, and more dense uh, residential use. Uh, I'm struggling with the, the disparity, I suppose, around those around those two. So uh, just my, my own personal views on that, but I'll, I'll support the commissioner for, for their decision making uh, in the process and the work that staff have put in to date. Uh, is there uh, any other comments or questions people would like to share? Uh, I guess we should also need to note this is another one of many private plan changes uh, that now we've had what, um, an approved and a declined by our council uh, and ongoing discussions around uh, what will be appealed uh, and what the next steps for these would be should uh, those that were either applicants uh, or sitting on the other side of the decision of the commissioner wish to take an alternate view to the um, outcome of the hearing. Uh, Mark, I'll hand to you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we, Council, aren't yep, taking a view on this. Just read it. Um, we are, this is rather a procedural um, report and recommendation. We're merely adopting the recommendation of the Commissioner who had a, the opportunity to consider the application, the submissions, evidence, um, and, and those things said in the hearing. So. We're not taking a position. We're confirming the commissioner's decision in a procedural way. So I think that it's, it, we've got to be cautious in those comments because um, council is has to process this in accordance with the RMA in a very neutral and um, independent way. Um, the com commissioner heard, as I said, heard all, went through the hearing process and has come out with a recommendation. It's up to us to endorse or not his recommendation, and I hope that we endorse it. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Any further comments or questions? All those in favour, please raise your hand. Sorry, Mark, you were speaking. Did we have a mover and second? No, we didn't. Mark, you're moving? I'd rather not. <laughs> Bob is moving, Murray seconding. Uh, Grant, your hands up. Did you have anything else to add? Uh, no, it was in the absence of a mover. I was happy to move it. I agree with Mark. It's a procedural motion that we don't want to get involved in. Great. All those in favour, please raise your hands. Everyone against, speak up now. Declare it carried. Thank you. Uh, plan change 76 is on tab 19, uh, page 417. Uh, accept the recommendation of the Independent Commissioner with regards to private plan change 76 for Rezone Land and Rolleston. Mover and seconder for this report. Sophie and Bob, 
any comments that people would like to share or on this decision or questions they have, Grant? Is this the appropriate time to discuss the public presentation? Because there will be a number of these coming to us, I guess. Well, I'll expand and you, you rule me out of water if I am. But no, you go ahead, to, Grant. To, to me, um, the submission that was made in public forum made a lot of sense. And it's just sort of, on one hand, we've got the government wanting us to accelerate land supply to, to provide more housing and to facilitate, um, you know, the ability of people to get into their first homes or whatever it is. But on the other hand, the unintended consequences of the legislation are that potentially this land won't be released for 2024. So I realise it's a difficult situation for the staff, but I would think that we should try and go out of our way when these have been approved to try and assist these developers to get land to market that people can buy and develop houses in the near future rather than long term. I know um, procedurally it looks difficult and I've read the documentation. It doesn't seem to be an easy way out, but it may be um, you know, a case of you representing to central government saying, you know, you've some really unintended consequences here of what you're proposing. Um, particularly when where we're stuck with our dis district plan um, and a pragmatic approach would be helpful but maybe it, it's not possible but it does seem like an enormous amount of time to, to hold these developments up. Thanks Grant and Shane and anyone else that wants to discuss this we'll have you first and then come to Tim uh, and any staff comment after that so Shane. I, just give, I guess given the uh, public presentation and understanding the um, huge financial risk that's also involved in this not Wanting to get in the way of the the process, but um, you know what is council's responsibility at the end of the day to, to assist these uh, what what are now property owners? So is there a mechanism? I'm sure the staff have uh, been through this already, but really just heartfelt uh, uh, sincerity going out to the the presenters that had come online before. Thanks for that, Shane. Sophie, I'm happy for Tim to speak first. If he had his hand up first, he's probably got some worthwhile information. Uh, you go, go first, Sophie. Yeah, you then. go first, Sophie. I'll wait. Okay. Um, I was just going to say, this is, this is really awkward as far as the legislation goes. I mean, yes, it's coming through quickly, but everything happens very quickly around growth around here as well. So the, so the, the question I asked when they were speaking, it, it does make me feel like... I, I don't want to be in a position where people are losing out, but I also feel in some ways that they kind of jumped the gun. I mean, they were selling sections before the hearing, um, presumably on the assumption that everything would go smoothly. Um, when the legislation was released, there was no, that they did, they admitted that they didn't take any legal advice or submit on or speak to a select committee or anything, which fair enough, when you're a relatively small business, you might not want to, but certainly taking legal advice especially when you've taken um, when you, when you've sold your sections already at that point you'd think that that would be something that, that I, I don't see this as I really sympathize but I don't see this as being our fault does that make sense um, they have made a series of business decisions and we are making decisions in line with legislation and legal advice and no one's going to win here it's it's awkward um, and that, ironically, the pace of change here is one of those reasons why this legislation is coming in. Um, yeah. Thanks, Sophie. And Murray? Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, I'm not sure. I, I guess I'm allowed to speak on this. I, I didn't get any challenges yeah. before. So, um, look, yes, it it is it unintended consequences that and I just think we we are incumbent and we may not solve it today and I know there's a potential potential way of solving this I think that we we need to to look at those alternatives as soon as we possibly can because it's not the only regardless of you know how we feel about whether you're pre-selling sections or anything else it's not the only plan change that's going to be in this in this space and and if we can't continue to have housing available you know, um, sections available for housing, sorry, um, the, then the purpose of this act has been uh, uh, counterintuitive to what the, the government are trying to do. So um, Grant's suggestion is a really good one, but I think also that we may need to just look at as many mechanisms as we can through staff. And yes, it's not, it's not our, pro we haven't created the problem, but we may be able to create the solution. And I think it's incumbent on us to look at as many ways as we can do that as possible. 
Thanks for that, Murray. Tim. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sam. Um, yes, look, uh, staff have got a lot of sympathy for um, Mr. Mr. Weaver, and I think there's about eight, seven or eight other plan changes that are similarly caught by um, this this process. It's none of our making, and actually, I think Clause 34 was introduced um, um, after the select committee that uh, both myself and Mayor Sam attended. So it was um, it was moving in um, as late as February of this uh, this year in terms of landing on a position. So we've had to act fairly fairly quickly. Um, all I can say is that it's very clear that we've got little option, no option. Um, I'm just looking at the clause now. It says the specified TA must not, must notify um, a variation to the plan change um, for these these plan changes called that time frame. So it's unequivocal. Not much room to move there. However, as I did signal before, we are exploring options in terms of allowing um, particular landowners potentially to apply for subdivisions ahead of their plan change becoming operative if it's not subject to appeal. So um, we are exploring that option, and we are reasonably optimistic that we'll be able to come with come up with a pathway forward. We have actually raised this with um, MFE, and I think um, Ben was actually on the phone to them today in terms of um, ident identifying this unintended consequence. They have agreed that it's unfortunate, but we are following um, the process um, according to the legislation. So um, it is unfortunate. We have some sympathy. We are exploring ways of um, moving forward their development, um, but it's, uh, yes, yeah, everyone's been caught by the legislation. Ben, I don't know if you've got anything else to add. Uh, no, nothing for me, Tim. No, it's not, except that it's probably not even a decision for council, um, particularly around Rolleston. Rolleston is clear, clearly caught by the legislation and we have to undertake this work. Um, but yeah, we are working on those alternatives. So we'll, we'll be in con um, contact with the uh, the developers and uh, trying to come up with alternatives, but uh, it's not ideal. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Tim. And you got the support of the council to do that. Just wondering, uh, could we expect a June report, put this under matters under investigation? There's a wider implication than just for the developer than public forum today. And it'd be great for us to keep abreast um, of, of where this is tra tracking. Yep, yeah, sure. That's, that sounds fine. Sam. Thanks. Uh, Theresa Nam, if you can note that for a, a matter. Uh, any further um, comments or questions on this? Did we have a mover and a seconder? No, I don't think we did. Um, anyone happy to? Bob and seconder. Sophie, uh, all those in favour, please raise your hands. And anyone against, speak up now. To clear carriage, thank you. Uh, the next item is plan change 80, that we accept the request for notification. Uh, mover, Shane, seconder. Murray, any comments or questions on this? All those in favour, please raise your hands. Anyone against, speak up now. Declare it carried. Uh, the next item is plan change 81. A uh, decision on how to consider the private plan change request that we resolve to accept the request for notification. Mover, Mark, seconded. Sophie, any comments or questions people have here? All those in favour, please raise your hands. Anyone's against, speak up now. Declare it carried. Uh, tab 22, item uh, page 477, plan change 82. Uh, that we resolve to accept the request for notification. Mover and a seconder. Malcolm and Sophie, any questions or comments on this one? All those in favour, please raise your hands. Anyone against, please speak up now. Declare it carried. Uh, we've dealt with the matter in public, and I think that concludes the public Sam. portion. Yes, Mark. I just think it would it, it would be helpful to, to still have that section under matters arising for public forum where we formally note in the minutes that it was dealt with under the discussion on PC seventy six. It shows that we have actually formally acknowledged the submission and considered it. Just for the reader of the minutes in six months' time, know that we did that. That's cool. We can add that to the agenda too, just to make sure we do catch it at the end of the meeting, whether it not be noted. 
it could be easy to skip over. So thanks, Mark, for doing that, and we will um, we will note that. We now um, move into PX. So I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us um, publicly today. It's been a good meeting, and thank you for taking an interest in the decisions that your councils have made. Kakite. And a mover and seconder that we move into public excluded, Malcolm, Nicole. All those in favour, please raise your hands. Anyone against, declare it carried. And we'll just take a minute and a half to make sure that's stopped.